Hey, Duvid here. Welcome. Um, been a while since I streamed last. Uh, last time I streamed on the multiple truth hypothesis was, uh, I'm sorry, checking the date, was almost two months ago. So uh, I, when I left off last, I introduced the multiple truth hypothesis and uh, did uh, the first stream on, uh, I'm just going to go straight into a screen share here. Sorry about uh, not being 100% ready. We talk about uh, like why I'm doing and what I expect out of these streams or what other people who might uh, watch these can expect out of these streams. Um, but I did uh, a first video on uh, June 17th on the, when I introduced the background to the multiple truth hypothesis and... Uh, Oh, I'm missing, uh, somehow my thing got deleted, my uh, uh, description there. And I have the second one where I uh, started to talk about chess. But, uh, you know, I talk about the philosophical uh, background of the famous geologist who had written a paper like over 100 years ago uh, on multiple truth, kind of uh, similar ideas. And... Uh, then I talked about other fields, uh, cognitive dissonance. In the first video also, I went uh, quite a bit into uh, cognitive dissonance. And uh, and then I talked about truth discovery, which is uh, how the computer goes about finding out truth. And uh, that's part of the reason I wanted to bring in chess into the picture. And uh, also talked about uh, the multiverse. And actually, I have a lot more stuff to go into on these matters. Uh, but I have a whole bunch of stuff specifically related to uh, chess. You see all these articles. I, I had these. I read almost all of these like already a month ago, and uh, I wasn't sure, you know, like when I'm going to stream, when I'm going to do it. And so today, here's the day I'm doing. I'm putting some forward. So there's a whole bunch of stuff, and, and uh, um, I want to design these videos so that they might be interesting to a chess player or someone just related to this field of uh, chess psychology thought, um, but I'm doing it in a larger picture for people who follow Duvid, uh, the channel and my research, uh, we can review that would include um, that would include uh, um, my thoughts on consciousness, the heart problem of consciousness, uh, the brain forming, uh, recognizing patterns. And chess is just the example. I'm going to go into a deep delve into what we know about how the mind goes about making decisions and uh, the related uh, mental things like intelligence and uh, memory and attention and various things. And actually chess is a very well-known thing that people have been playing for um, hundreds of years. And almost all of the major names in philosophy, psychology, uh, have thought about chess. And so there's a, a wealth of research. I'm going to go over that. And uh, you know, so it's not necessarily designed for people who want to improve their chess play. And as for this video, I'm not really going to be showing any chess positions or talking about chess strategy. I'm just going to be talking about uh, the generic process that the mind uses to go about playing chess and improving at chess. And uh, this is going to be related to uh, what I'm pushing forward in the multiple truth hypothesis and my understanding of uh, consciousness and uh, various other uh, things. So let's just jump right in with the first little article here about chess psychology and give us a little um, background on the history of chess psychology. So uh, put this in the chat, and I'll also be talking about uh, artificial intelligence in terms of how the computer plays chess. I have a lot of research to get for. I apologize, I haven't streamed in a while, and it, it's very difficult to organize and present this information in a way. And, and towards the beginning of my streaming, to some extent, I'm doing this purely as a mental exercise uh, for myself to help myself understand this. Although for anyone who follows my ideas, hopefully it'd be beneficial to other people or a random chess player, someone interested in uh, free will and 
decision making might also find this interesting kind of like a graduate seminar which is basically going to be a reading of a bunch of uh, uh scientific papers except in, uh, as opposed to having uh you know the people uh, the professors of various fields reading the papers it's got all do it okay so let's look at this first one um bill wall famous uh, chess uh journalist has a nice introductory paper here i'll read on chess psychology from uh, bill wall's uh, chess blog chess is considered the dress drasophilia of cognitive psychology the psychology of chess and its research has been around for many years and has been a significant impact in the field of cognitive science because of the experimental and theoretical tools it has provided chess provides a model task environment for the study of basic cognitive processes such as perception memory and problem solving 1894, Alfred Binet carried out the first psychological study of the game of chess with emphasis on mental abilities of chess masters. In 1903, he was the first psychologist to develop an intelligence test. He devised the intelligence quotient test, IQ test, where the intelligence score was the quotient of the mental age to the physical age. Binet observed blindfold chess players as a subject subset of his investigations into memory. To the average person playing a game of chess without a sight of a board represents an extremely difficult, if not impossible, challenge to the memory. Binet's experiment consisted of a survey which was taken by players of any skill level from novice to master. He came to the conclusion that blindfold chess players need knowledge and experience, imagination, and memory. The masters who took part in the survey gave introspective accounts that had some similarities and yet several differences concerning their blindfold play. A common thread among their response was the fact that they did not use tassel imagery to represent the board. In addition, they were generally, generally able to remember all the moves played in the sequence of blindfold games. One master, Goats, was able to quickly recall all 336 moves that he made over 10 blindfold games played simultaneously. Binet concluded that verbal memory was an integral part of blindfold play. Finally, the subjects reported the need to be aware of a general plan of action for each game although this would seem to be necessary for both blindfold and regular chess play. The masters differed on whether they used visual or abstract imagery to represent the board. The majority said that they used only an abstract representation combined with sub-vocalizations of previous moves to mentally examine the board. A small majority, including the well-known master Blackburn, claimed to visualize an actual chessboard with pieces on it corresponding to the current position, just as if before the eyes. Binet thus came to the realization that his original hypothesis of strong visual memory being essential for blindfold chess was wrong. In addition, he did not explore the almost direct correspondence between experience and ability in blindfold chess. Binet recounted his experiments in a book entitled Psychology in Grand Calculators uh, of the Game of Chess, which is uh, linked in this article. So in 1703, Alfred Cleveland, uh, which we're going to look at, published The Psychology of Chess and Learning to Play It in the American Journal of Psychology. Um, Cleveland wrote that chess appeals to the fundamental instinct of combat in a way that is direct and at the same time exempt from the antisocial features that are inherent in actual physical combat. The author states that chess takes hold upon the uh, suppressed survival of savage impulse, which is a large factor in adult sport. The desire to win is fundamentally connected with the fighting instinct, and every chess player finds the elation of victory or the bitterness of defeat. Cleveland feels that chess players that work hard at the game feel the outcome in proportion to their efforts, despite repeated suggestions from books on how to accept defeat. Cleveland wrote that every chess club has members that make excuses for every lost game. However, he says that chess players do not enjoy winning if their victory is the result of a fluke on their own part or a major oversight in the part of their opponent. Cleveland's methodology correspondence with chess players found that the player's temperament enters into play in determining its style. A player will try to force an opponent to adapt a line of play for which the opponent was unfitted by temperament. The example he gives is that a player will adopt a slow, careful game against an aggressive and daring player who is then often provoked by these tactics into recklessness and loss. Cleveland asked a variety of chess players how many moves do they plan ahead. The number varied from position to position. It was also dependent upon the number of positions of the pieces in the player's physical and mental conditions at time. Very few play, uh, chess players of average experience stated that they were unable to plan at least three moves ahead in a complicated situation. Four, five, and six were the most favorite numbers that most chess players said on how many moves ahead they could plan. Most stated that they could anticipate as many of their opponent's moves as they 
uh, plan for themselves. With experience and practice, while most players say that they can increase the number of moves planned ahead, the increase in accuracy was the main gain. The beginner is not able to plan far ahead and scarcely thinks of his opponent's plans at all. A little later, the beginner plans two to four moves ahead, but he overlooks uh, so many possibilities that his plans are practically worthless. Cleveland found that all three classes of player, when it comes to visual imagination, the first class was made up of those who have a clear visual picture of the situation as it will appear after a series of moves. Then there were a class of players who have some visual picture, but rely also on successive associations and verbal possible motor terms of one move with another. They were unable to picture a resulting situation, but must build it up move by move by means of visual and other kinds of imagery. With these players, the final term is probably held in verbal terms. The last class of players are those who are without a visual image of any sort. This group relies wholly on the presence of the pieces in reconstructing an unfinished game. Cleveland found that little or no trouble is experienced by most players in setting up an unfinished game from memory, provided the game itself was interesting and too great a time had not elapsed. The number of pieces on the board was also a factor, though it appeared that it was not of very great importance. Certain methods are used in setting up a final position. Some have a mental picture of the whole board and can arrange their pieces accordingly. They have photographed the situation as a whole, and their eyes tell them if anything is out of order or missing. Others reconstruct the final position as a whole, but do not by remembering criti- uh, but do it by remembering critical, crucial situations and building around them. Uh, this memory may be in terms of almost any sort of imagery, but is most likely to be in visual terms. Some players begin back of the final position at some interesting place and build up to it. Another method is replaying the game from the beginning. This means running over a series of successive associations aided and guided by the critical points and by the general plan of the whole game, which gives a meaning to the individual moves. The reconstruction from memory of a position involving any considerable number of pieces is not possible to most beginners. They get lost in the mass of impressions, which is the situation involves. Cleveland observed that many chess players have positional sense which is the knack of knowing in an intricate situation how to place the men to the best advantage. He observed that many chess players are able to tell at a glance which player has the better position without being able to give offhand any reason for their opinion. Many players were able to give a correct judgment at times without being able to carry out the analysis necessary to prove its correctness. Some of the reasons to account for the ability to judge a position at glance are as follows. The mind has been drilled to feel any deviation from principles, It is due to a vague idea of similar situations leading to success or failure. It is the recognition of several fundamental points of strengths or weakness. And lastly, it is a symbolic shortening, a dropping out of intermediate process of inference. It appears that positional sense is not dependent on memory alone. Certain mental qualities are essential to strong chess players. Many uh, players have an accurate and persistent chess memory, quickness of perception, strong construction, imagination, power of accurate analysis, and far seeing power of combination, a chess master displays his skill in one or all of four forms. There are simultaneous play, blindfold play, recapitulation of games played by himself or others, and an actual play by the announcement of the end of the game several moves before the event. Skilled players represent all walks of life, but the skill at chess is not incompatible with success in other lines. At the same time, the cases of idiot savants in chess prevent the influence that skill in chess is universally a valid index of high mental endowment. Cleveland says that chess is a difficult game because it requires a peculiar mental equipment rather than because it calls for one of especially high order. First and foremost, it requires a liking for chess. The person who finds chess uninteresting may well give up at once, according to Cleveland. Next, it requires powers of sustained attention and excellent memory. It also requires considerable powers of analysis and visual imagination. An increase in chess skill means an increase in the knowledge of chess situations and how to meet them. In psychological terms, increase in meaning in certain arrangements of chess pieces and increased facility of association between those meaningful arrangements and other arrangements imaginatively constructed. Skills in chess is largely, though not wholly, in proportion to the knowledge and knowledge is proportion to the experience. We've then divided a chess player's progress into five stages. The first step is to learn the names and movements of the pieces. The second stage is the individual moves 
of offense and defense during which the beginning play uh, beginner plays with no definite aim other than to capture the opponent's pieces. This, the lack of conception of aim of the game causes the beginner to play at random. However, in the background of consciousness, some idea of the ultimate object is of the play is being formulated. In the third step, the beginner is soon able to tell at a glance what any single piece can do, but no one piece is very strong unless supported by others. Hence, the task in the third stage becomes that of learning the strength not of individual pieces, but of pieces in relation to each other. The play has entered upon a fourth stage when he begins consciously to plan the systematic development of his pieces. The fifth stage is when the player has developed positional sense. This is the result of experience and the culmination of one's whole chess development. Another observation that Cleveland made was that short periods of rest from chess practice varying with individual form uh, a, a few weeks to several months may cause a notable increase in skills. Renewed interest and consequent greater effort in beginning chess again after an interval of no play may account for this part, and it may also be that in constant playing, the details accumulate faster than the mind can assimilate them, so they confuse rather than aid the player. When the uh, stress of new impression ceases, an opportunity is given to take an inventory of the mental stock. This is not possible when new impressions are crowding in and the attention is fully occupied with them. For long periods of inactivity, chess players make blunders in the openings, their combinations are not so far reaching, and greater effort is required. Every part of the game that requires pure memory is affected and is often necessary to do consciously of what had previously been automatic. Increasing complexity of nervous function parallels, increasing complexity of mental functions. Shalom, John. Thanks for tuning in. 1925, three Russian psychologists from the Psychotechnics Institute of Moscow studied eight of the um, best grandmasters of the time. During the strong international chess tournament in Moscow, the players included Emmanuel Lasker, Richard Retty, Salvary Tartakower, Tori, uh, Romanovsky, Grunfeld, Spielman. Each player was given a variety of psychological tests, and their performance was compared to subjects who were not chess players. Tasks included assessments of memory, attention, and concentration, and speed and accuracy of performing various intellectual problems like checking arithmetic uh, calculations. Their imagination, willpower, and personality type were also evaluated. They did not find any differences uh, with a control sample of general intelligence or visual spatial uh, memory, with the exception of memory tasks where the material to be recalled was closely related to chess. For example, the chess masters performed better in memorizing dots in an eight by eight matrix presented for one minute than the memory for an artistic chess problem where White had to make an end moves. They uh, published their result in 1927. However, two difficulties affect the interpretation of the study. First, the subject of the control group did not play chess at all. Hence, many have not been familiar with the material second position of was a chess problem, not a true random position. So we have uh, this first, uh, you know, which, which I have here, this book, and hopefully we'll have time to look at the psychology, Journal of Psychology, The Psychology of Chess and Learning to Play It by Alfred Cleveland. And uh, Bill Hall gave a very nice summary there that I was happy to read through most of it. And you see that, you know, Alfred Binet and Henry, people had thought about how does the mind form thought? How does the mind go about learning how to play chess? And so, you know, I went quite into detail on Henry um, discussing that. And if someone who's taught hundreds of kids how to play chess, um, I was quite impressed with Henry. Um, and now you know, he's going to move on with the famous uh, chess experiments and studies over the time, you know, through the study of grandmasters and seeing that do they really differ in intelligence from normal people. And generally the findings have shown that uh, there isn't any significant uh, big differences between chess players and non chess players or people who excel at chess and people who don't excel at chess. Let's continue with Bill Hall's um, blog here. Other studies such as those done, uh, such as those done by Uta Rayner, Kohler, Halsbin and Ram and Netaji have failed to demonstrate that chess players are more intelligent than non-chess players. Other studies have failed to find a link between chess skills and intelligence within chess players. In contrast, a few studies on children consistently found a link between chess skill and intelligence. Um, Friedman and Lin 
found that an elite sample of children, uh, chess players, and IQ score higher than their average peers. In the 1940s, Edward Lasker wrote an organized study that was made of a dozen leading chess masters by a group of psychologists. It found that chess masters' memory was only exceptional where positions on the chessboard were concerned. Search functions at chessboards, including the number of candidate moves visited and the depth of search, may not differ between masters and amateurs, according to DeGroote. His findings were that grandmasters do not search uh, reliable deeper than amateurs. However, other studies show that strong players really do search deeper than weaker players. A holding argued that DeGroote's experiment wasn't good enough to detect existing differences between grandmasters and amateurs. DeGroote's research is discussed in length and thought and choice in chess, which I have here, which is his PhD dissertation in a book published in 1965 and 1978. DeGroote's uh, main theoretical motivation was to apply Otto Zelt's framework called on the psychology of productive thinking and error uh, to problem solving in chess. According to Zelt's, thinking can be viewed as a continuous and linear chain of operations. The group's research established that Zelt's framework could explain the main aspects of chess thinking. DeGroote used two experimental tasks, a problem solving and a memory task. He has chess players to think aloud when pondering their next move in a position previously unknown to them. Players then investigate the same continuation several times, either immediately or, or having directed their attention to different variations, a process that DeGroote named progressive deepening. In every case, strong players chose better moves than weaker players. The real question was how this choice took place. Another experiment, uh, positions taken from master games were shown for a period of 2 to 15 seconds. Players of grandmaster strength were able to reproduce correctly almost the entire position every time, while weaker players could retain only a few pieces. Typically, the masters and grandmasters were able to replace about 23 or 24 out of the 25 uh, correct, correctly after five seconds or less. The average player could only get a few pieces, around 16 pieces, replaced correctly. The result could not be attributed to the master's general superior memory ability for when chess positions were constructed by placing the same number of pieces randomly on the board, the masters then could do no better in reconstructing them than the weaker players. In 1967, Dr. Ruben Fine claimed that any chess master should be able to play at least one game of blindfold chess. To the average person, playing a game of chess without the sight of a board represents an extremely difficult, if not impossible, challenge for the memory. Blindfold chess players need knowledge and experience, imagination and memory. Masters who were tested in blindfold games were generally able to remember all the moves played in a sequence of blindfold games. Masters differed on whether they used visual or abstract imagery to represent the chessboard. The majority of masters said that they used only an abstract representation combined with sub-vocalizations of previous moves uh, to mentally examine the board. And also, have a blindfold chess by Hurst and Knott. So 1973, William Chase, and uh, we're going to look at this paper also. This is one of the famous papers in uh, chess history. Um, so in 1973, William Chase and Herbert Simon, both of Carnegie Mellon University, published Perception in Chess in Cognitive Psychology. The paper devote, uh, developed a technique for isolating and studying the perceptual structures of chess players uh, perceived. Chess players of different strength were confronted with reproducing a chess position in plain view in a short-term recall task where the player reproduces a chess position after viewing it for five seconds. The successive glances at the position in the perpetual task and long pauses in memory tasks were used to segment the structures and reconstruction protocol. The size and nature of these structures were then analyzed as a function of chess skill. The previous studies of chess perception shows that chess masters encode information about positions in chunks but for provided no direct method for delim delimiting the chunk boundaries or detaching the relations that hold among the components of a chunk. More understanding is needed to discover how many pieces can constitutes a chunk, what the relative sizes of the chunks of masters and weaker players, and how many chunks players retain after a brief view of a position. Chunk size is larger for more skilled players, and the number of chunks is within the memory span. Pieces within a single chunk are bound by relations of mutual defense, proximity, attack over small distances, and common color and type. The size of a master's vocabulary chess-related configurations was initially estimated to be 50 to 100,000 chunks, <coughs> although small perceptual chunks are most likely supplemented by large structures called templates. 
So in 1979, David Lane and Lauren Robertson, both of Rice University, tested the hypothesis that memory for chess positions is a function of the depth of processing, in particular the richness of stimulus elaboration afforded by the combination of task and skill level conditions. They tested non-rated beginners and rated chess players and could not find relationship between chess skill and recall under formal orienting instructions or no relationship between chess skill and memory for random positions. Only when the subjects were able to perceive the 64 squares in various pieces as meaningful configuration does the player with a better understanding of chess show any superiority. In addition to being familiar with more patterns of chess pieces, the stronger players are better than weaker players at integrating familiar configurations into coherent whole. So Dr. Ferdinand Gobet, professor of cognitive psychology and international master, former Swiss junior champion and Swiss champion, is co-editor of the Swiss Chess Review from 1981 to 89. He wrote a PhD dissertation on the memories of chess player. He has written many books and articles about chess and psychology. He has been studying many aspects of chess psychology, such as mental imagery, pattern recognition, studying, and patterns of chess players. Uh, we're going to look at his paper also. In 1986, Gobit tried to replicate the group's 1946 experiment of grandmasters versus amateur experimentation of chess positions. Gobit was able to test four IMs, eight masters, and a total of 48, 48 Swiss chess players on a series of chess quizzes in which the goal was to find the best move for white without moving the pieces, with thinking time limited to 30 minutes. After studying hundreds of chess players, Gobit had found a strong correlation between the number of hours chess players have dedicated to chess and their current ratings. In one study of 104 players, 101 males, 3 females, including 39 untitled players without any rating, 39 untitled players with ratings, 13 FIDE masters, 10 international masters, and 3 grandmasters, he found that the unrated players reported an average of 8,300 hours of dedication to chess. The rated but untitled players reported 11,715 hours. The FMs reported 19,618 hours and the IMs reported 27,929 hours, no information on the GMs. It took an average of 11,000 hours to reach 2,200. One player needed around 3,000 hours to reach 2,200, while another player spent more than 23,000 hours to achieve the same level. The average master, 2,257, had seven years of serious practice. The average expert, 2,174, had 1.3 years of serious practice. The masters increased their rating and average of seven ELL points per year of series practice, whereas the experts only increased their rating an average of one ELL point per year of series practice. Experts increased their chess playing skill level very little with time, whereas masters kept increasing theirs. In Gobit sur survey, 83% of the players reported playing blitz, 80% had a coach at some point, 63-7 used uh, databases, um, 66% played against chess programs, 56% followed chess games without using a chess board, 23% played blindfold games, stronger players were more likely to have a chess coach, use databases, and played blitz. Strong players also tended to own more chess books and read them than weaker players. As an individual activity, reading chess books was the most important predictor of chess skill. For group activity, coaching and speed games were the most significant predictors of chess skill, but less a predictor with age. Dr. Gobit also found that group practice, including tournament games, was a better predictor of high-level performance than individual practice. It has been shown that non-professional players who started playing chess at a young age show interest and commitment to chess until the late teens. This is when the amount of time devoted to chess peaks at about 18. After this, players start work or attend university and or get married, which reduces the time spent playing chess by the mid-30s when family and work issues are more sta stable. Non-professional chess players return to the game and play more frequently. Gobit showed that there was a clear indication that the first three years of serious chess play practice in early age are much more advantageous than the first three years of serious practice at later ages. Most masters became serious about chess between 10 and 12. Most experts became serious about chess about 14. One important role in chess skill is pattern recognition versus the ability to search through the problem space. Through years of practice and study, masters have learned several hundred thousand of perceptual chess patterns called chunking. When one of these patterns is recognized in a particular position, the master then has rapid access to information such as potential moves or move sequences, tactics, and strategies. This explains the automatic intuitive discovery of good moves by a master, as well as extraordinary memory for game-like chess positions. 
data from speed chess and simulate simultaneous chess show that limitations in thinking uh, time do not impair chess master performance. Chess masters seem to be more highly selective on of their moves and direct their attention rapidly to good moves. Grandmasters do not look at a lot of continuations of the game before choosing a move. It seems a chunking recognition of known chess patterns play a key role in master's ability to play fast and accurate. So do strong players rely more on analyzing various alternatives? Or do they rely on recognizing familiar chess patterns as the situation? Do chess players put most of their emphasis on their analytical skills or on building up a huge knowledge base in their head? Perhaps it is a combination of search skills and pattern recognition. Both pattern recognition and search models predict that strong chess players choose better moves, that they select moves faster, and that they generate more nodes in one minute. Gobit showed that the first prediction was met, but the second and third were supported only weakly. Search models predict that strong players search more nodes and search deeper. The first prediction was not met, but the second was in that the difference lies in the average depth of search, not in the maximum depth of search. Finally, pattern recognition models predict that strong players mention fewer base moves, reinvestigate more often the same move, and jump less often between different moves all these predictions were met. Gobit showed that another possible predictor of chess skill might be the starting age, the average age at which players of each group started playing seriously was the followed non-rated players, 18 uh, years, rated players, 14 FMs, 11.6 years, IMs, 10.3 years, GMs, uh, the small sample, 11.3. Almost all the players with titles started playing seriously no later than 12. Becoming a master requires training activity that go beyond the type of repetitive and feedback-informed activities typically emphasized in earlier days. Chess theory and computer technology has changed the way chess players prepare for their games. Masters try to memorize opening variations with the aid of chess databases. They investigate opening positions to find novelties to surprise their opponents, and they play tournament or training games against other players or on the internet against strong computer programs. Dr. Gobit has also Look into the personalities of chess players. Studies have found that adult chess players are more introverted and intuitive than the general population. However, it is more energetic and extroverted children that are more likely to play chess. These children are, in general, more likely to try out activities such as chess than their less extroverted peers. Children players who were stronger in chess than their peers were more curious, had broader intellectual and cultural interests, and were more accomplished in school than children who were weaker chess players. In addition, stronger players also tend to uh, be more intuitive than weaker ones. Chess players also scored higher than non-players on the measure of orderliness and unconventional thinking. Another consideration in chess thinking is the level of aging among chess players. Uh, studies have shown that in memory tasks where positions are briefly presented for the same skill level, young players recall chess positions better than older players. In spite of producing worse performance than younger players of the same skill level and memory task, older players perform equally well in problem-solving tasks where they had to choose the best move and that they were also faster at choosing their move. In 1985, Dennis Holding argued the main detriment of chess skill is the ability to plan ahead by search rather than reliance on recognition of positional patterns. Specifically, he concluded the differences between players at different levels of skill seem to attribute to differences of cognitive abilities described by the search and evaluation theory. The better players show greater competence in every phase of the search process, conducting more knowledgeable evaluations in order to anticipate events on the chessboard. 1990, Petri Saraluma, French psychologist and professor of cognitive science, studied the search function of top players and suggested the international masters and grandmasters sometimes search less than master chess players. In typical positions, he found that masters with a 2200 ELL rating looked at 52 nodes and the largest depth of 5.1 moves. By comparison, the IM and GM searched on average 23 nodes with an average of 3.6 moves. Sarloom conducted a series of experiments which suggest that the grandmasters are much quicker than novice in certain low-level perceptual processes. In one experiment, a king of one color was placed on the chessboard along with a piece of the other color. The subject had to state whether the king was in check or not. The average latencies were as followed novices uh, 1,550 milliseconds, chess players 1,250 milliseconds, experts 900 milliseconds, grandmasters 650 milliseconds. The result indicated that skill is inversely proportional to the reaction time. After a century of investigation, not a single study with adult chess players has managed to establish a link between chess skill and intelligence. 
Ilek had little predictive power among strong chess players. In uh, 1996, Charnas and others surveyed tournament-related chess players from Europe, Russia, and Canada to ascertain their beliefs about the relevance of different chess activities to their overall chess skill and to collect the estimates of the frequency of the durations of time spent of these different activities. Although participants in the study rated active participation in tournaments as slightly more relevant to improving one's chess skill than serious analysis of position alone, subsequent regression analysis revealed that cumulative serious solitary chess study was the single most powerful predictor of chess skill rating among a broad set of potential predictors, including tournament playing coaching. 1996, Fernard Gabor and Herbert Simon looked at the hypothesis of chess master's superiority in recalling meaningful material from their domain of expertise vanish when random material is used. However, they found that strong players generally do maintain some superiority over weak players, even with random positions, although the relative differences between skill levels is much smaller than with game positions. With thousands of hours of intense practice and study, one would expect a master to have stored numerous chunks in their long-term memory, including some unusual features which would allow them to recognize more often than weak players familiar chunks that occur in random positions, thereby obtaining advantage in recall. It is also possible that masters have developed strategies to cope with uncommon situations which occur sometimes in practice. In addition, their familiarity with the material better known as the uh, knowledge of the topology of the chess broad in its attributes could give them some advantage in comparison with non-experts. Gobin and Simon's findings showed that recall of random positions varies somewhat as a function of chess skill. This could be due to three possibilities, a large database of chunks and long-term memory, occasionally allowing the recognition of stored patterns that occur by chance in random positions, the possessions of strategies for coping with uncommon positions, and better knowledge of the topology of the chessboard. 2001, Rheingold, Charnas, uh, Pomplum, and Stamp employed eye movement monitoring techniques in order to provide direct evidence for the hypothesis that perceptual advantage is a fundamental component of chess skill. They predicted that perceptual advantage accruing to master chess players would be reflective in a larger view span for chess-related visual patterns, but not for patterns unrelated to chess. Um, the encoding of chunks rather than individual pieces by chess masters would result in fewer fixations and fixations between uh, rather than on individual pieces. Prior research on eye fixations in chess had shown differences in variables such as fixation during duration and coverage of the chessboard. Previous studies showed that chess masters had an advantage in immediate memory for chess-related information following a very brief exposure to an unfamiliar position. This study extended the findings by showing that masters have been had an advantage in extracting perceptual information in an individual fixation. Uh, for check to the king detection, the master extracts the necessary interpiece relation from both the foveal part of the retina that permits 100% visual acuity and the parafoveal region of the retina that covers 10 degrees radius around the foveal regions. Advanced chess skill attenuates change of blindness by improving target detection in meaningful but not scrambled chess configurations, and this effect is due to the greater span size relative to less skilled chess players. Motivation in chess is very important. The importance of the right motivation, all favor psychological factors not directly related to the technical knowledge of the game, uh, such as competitive spirit and the ability to remain calm under pressure, is widely acknowledged throughout the chess world, especially in matches between top players. Psychological factors are thought to exert a substantial effort effect on the outcome. Success in chess is most likely to the product of ability and motivation. Studies by uh, Joryman, Fick, and Anderson show that chess players score higher on tests of sensation seeking than do controls. A motivation questionnaire was added to the Amsterdam chess test to help measure chess playing proficiency. The questionnaire consisted of three sets of 10 items. Each set of items measured a separate motivational trait positive fear of failure, negative fear of failure, and desire to win. Items were both positively and negatively worded and included many statements such as overpowering my opponent makes me feel good. 2005, a group of researchers looked at the role of the deliberate practices and chess expertise among a large, diverse group of tournament-rated chess players. They found chess players at the highest skill level expended about 5,000 hours of serious chess study alone during their first decade of serious uh, chess play, nearly five times the average amount reported by intermediate level players. 
These results provide further evidence to support the argument that deliberate practice plays a critical role in the acquisition of chess expertise. The researchers gather information on current skill rating, total hour logs of serious study, total hour logs of tournament play, total years of private instruction, total years of group instruction, current hours per week of serious study, current hours per week of tournament play, chess books own current age, starting age, and serious age uh, for over 400 players over six years. Cumulative study alone was the strongest predictor of current skill among the chess activities with cumulative competitive play and cumulative individual instruction uh, showing some additional influence. Okay, great. So that one was uh, pretty long, it, you know, nice uh, introduction there. So you got high T in uh, the chat. Appreciate uh, people showing up. So show some interesting books. Here you got Blindfold Chess by Elliot Hurst and Jean Nat. History, Psychology, Techniques, Champions, World Records, and Important Games. I found this book very interesting. Um, here is the very famous uh, Thought and Choice in Chess, uh, the most quoted of all studies on chess, um, translated from the Dutch by Adrian de Groot. Um, so that is, you know, has been mentioned in the study, uh, that book. And uh, so we're going to take a look at the uh, re-enter screen share. So um, okay. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I'm specifically here to talk about this chess study. Uh, maybe a different time we'll talk about a different topic. So just here is a uh, um, research gate, and here is science papers quoting de Groot's thought and choice in chess. So not just studies on chess, but studies period um, about thought, um, and de Groot is one of the most quoted of all psychological studies, very popular author, and you know, so I'm not focusing on how to become a better chess player, but I'm just studying the nature of how the brain forms thoughts and makes decision using the best of the research from chess. So that Bill Hall, I mean, if, yeah, I wish I could have made PowerPoints or a better presentation for like historical view. Um, but, you know, the early psychologists like Binet, Henry, um, Bergson thought about chess, wondered how is it that we... Uh, you uh, accomplish uh, making decisions of chess because it's a popular game, how do kids learn the game, and what accounts for the difference of skill? What goes on in one person's head when they make the right move and someone else doesn't? What's the difference between one kid who excels and comes good and uh, one that doesn't? And a uh, common question people have been asking for a while and uh, and then formally studying it. So De Groot, you know, back uh, in the pre you know, period, uh, uh, I'm not sure the psychological uh, psychological term of the schools to define it in, was looking more like Binet, where he was just listening to people explain the process that they went through. And, uh, you know, modern psychology, now they're looking for like neuroscience or tests that are measuring eye movements or CAT scans and uh, actual measuring of tests where, where people are given task to do and it's measured as opposed to just uh, taking people's word for it of how they went about it. But, uh, you know, this book, Thought and Choice in Chess, is uh, you know, one of the basis for uh, um, psychology, not just of chess, but but period. So let's look at uh, um, this man, Gobit, uh, who we're going to look at his paper, wrote a little uh, overview of uh, Alex Adrian de Groot. Marriage of Two Passions. In this contribution, which is a tribute to Adrian de Groot in relation to his recent passing away, I would like to introduce the reader to his remarkable personality and to present the main tenets of his psychology of chess skill. I shall start by giving an overview of his chess and academic life, then basing my account on, on his seminal thesis and on more recent empirical and theoretical work, I will focus on his contributions to chess psychology. Chess and psychology, a double career. Whatever their level, chess players are interested even fascinated by the mental processes that allow them to choose a move in a position. There are multiple reasons for this interest, a better knowledge of 
their decision-making processes may allow them to improve their chess level. It may offer a glimpse on why some chess players have reached the grandmaster level while others have not. And above all, it may quench the perennial curiosity of most about the mental life and its working. A groundbreaking response to the question was offered more than 60 years ago by Adrian de Groot in a monumental thesis that was published in 1946, translated into English in 1965, and that was devoted as its title in translation, Thought and Choice in Chess, indicates to the psychology of thinking and the decision-making in chess. De Groot's thesis did not, however, attract the interests of chess players only. It was a uh, harbinger of the cognitive revolution in psychology that would occur in the early 60s because of its strong impact on cognitive psychology and because of the branch of the study, De Groot's thesis can safely be considered a classic in the field. Adrian Groot was born October 26, 1914 in Sandport, the village near Harlem, a family where education and chess were held in high esteem. After the gymnasium, De Groot took physics and mathematics at the University of Amsterdam. At the time, there was no direct curriculum for studying psychology in the Netherlands, and students had to take psychology as a post-candidate addendum to establish disciplines among his teachers. In mathematics, one finds Brouwer, the famous founder of the institutional school. In addition to being a rich time for his scientific education, there was also an exciting time for his chess career. As he put it, I was half student, half chess player. So the chess experiments. Early on, de Groot decided to combine his interest in chess and psychology. In 1938, he published an essay on the role of talent in chess. More importantly, at this time, he started to collect data on what was to become his PhD thesis. His main interest was on the processes that allowed chess players to choose a move. Two main tasks were designed to explore the mind of chess players. And the first, chess players had to think aloud when studying a position unknown to them. The protocols, that is, the transcripts of players' verbal utterances obtained in the way were subjected to a deep statistical and imperative analysis. The results were surprising. Grandmasters do not play better moves, but do not differ substantially from candidate masters in structural variables such as number of moves, the depth of search, and the number of positions visited, and so on. These roots led to group to suspect that the obvious superiority of masters and chess skills had to do with how they perceive a position. This induced him to devise a second type of experiment that attempted to shed light on the chess player's perception and memory. In this task, a position was presented for a short amount of time, to 15 seconds, after which the subjects had to reconstruct it as precisely as possible. The group found that huge superior of masteries over candidate masters and amateurs. We have, we'll have more to say about these res results and their theoretical interpretations in the second part of this contribution. The way de Groot collected this data in his thesis is interesting in and of itself. Then still a student, he used uh, to earn some money as a chess journalist. In 1938, he was covering the Arvo tournament, which was held in Amsterdam with the world's best eight players. Throughout the, through the intervention of a friend, Max Yu, de Groot managed to convince, among others, most of the Arvo players to participate in his experiments. Chess giants such as Alakine, Yu, Fine, Four, and Carries agreed to act as subjects. Some of the experiments, for example, the one with Tartakar were run over, were run on the steamer carrying the players to the 1939 Olympiads in Argentina. The protocols are reproduced in the English edition of de Groot's thesis, and apart from their scientific value, are great fun for chess aficionados to read. In the war years, as it was rapidly overtaken by scientific duties, de Groot's chess career was short and took place mainly during his student years. During the first participation in tournament abroad, he defended the Netherlands in the nation's tournament held in Munich. Later, he played in the Stockholm and Buenos Aires Olympiads. In 1937, he was champion of Amsterdam. And then 1938, he finished fourth in the very strong version of the Dutch championships in which the best players of the country took part, including the ex-world champion, Max Yu. The war and the preparation of his dissertation showed slowed down his chess activity. His last participation in international tournament was 1947 in the Hugoven tournament in general style may be characterized as an active search for initiative, as will be clear from the games presented below. Although rich for research in chess psychology, the early 40s, a tragic period in history of humankind, had their share of sadness for the group. Friends disappeared or were killed by the Nazis. An important loss for the group was the death of the German psychologist Otto Zeltz, who was deported to German concentration camp in 1943 because of his Jewish ordinance. Zeltz, who landed in Amsterdam as a late refugee professor of psychology, had 
been a profound impact on de Groot's thought throughout his entire career. The main thrust of de Groot's thesis was to provide evidence for Zelt's proposition that human thought can be described as a linear chain of operations. Academic career during the war, de Groot's career swung away from chess. He did some work as a secondary school teacher in mathematics and as a staff psychologist for an institute uh, for industrial and vocational training. In 1946, he was psychology, psychological advisor to Phillips Electrical in Eindhoven. He became a lecturer in 1948 and then professor in 1950 at the University of Amsterdam. Here he started his long-term research into methodology, applied psychology and education, which earned him a wide recognition in the Netherlands. His main contribution was the raising of the level of expertise in the fields of achievement testing in psychometrics, a subfield of psychology devoted to the development of instruments for measuring psychological aptitudes and traits. This resulted in the establishment of an Institute for Achievement Test uh, Development at the disposal of Netherlands educational system and founding a strong Dutch tradition in psychometrics. He also published an influential book on methodology in which in addition to more technical material he presented some of his views on the philosophy of science. Note the broad range of scientific contributions, cognitive psychology, education, methodology, and philosophy of science. Cur curiously, we can add psychoanalysis to the list as he published early in his career a psycho and electrical oriented book on the legend of St. Nicholas, a legend that is to be found in many parts of Europe. In the 60s, his interest in chess psychology, which had somewhat faded since the completion of his thesis, was revived during the year he spent at Stanford Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Science de Groot and his young Dutch colleague, Nico Fridja, had a brief stay at the Carnegie Mellegan Institute of Technology to visit artificial intelligence researchers about psychologist Herbert Simon, and Ellen Newell, who were working on programming computer to play chess. On his return to the Netherlands, he started with Fridja, a project called Thought and Memory, part of which was experimentation program on chess perception and memory. The project included an application of information theory to chess and the strong, uh, the study of chess players' eye movement. Rika Jungman, then a student of de Groot and strong chess player, played an instrumental role in the research. His thesis gives a good overview of the main questions addressed by the Amsterdam group. The late interest, retired since 18, 1985, de Groot resided with his wife Elsa in uh, Shiromanigug, uh, Frisian Island north of uh, Groningen. His many interests kept him quite busy, a completion of some old scientific projects, music, both as a piano and improviser and a violinist, and an amateur chamber ensemble and chess, of course, taking care of his many guests. During his retirement, the group spent much of his energy on philosophical questions, most of them related to psychology. A first theme is related to the notion of truth and science. The form theory, which had been developing over 30 years, insists on the idea that science is a communal activity directed towards rational consensus. As there is no absolute truth in science, all that science can do is strive for truth, that is to strive for theories having the highest possible level of certainty. This criterion is met in the case of statements that are unanimously endorsed by all pertinent scientific experts. Such statements then are scientifically true to the best of our present knowledge. Neither are the rules for the correct way of conducting science unchangeable or indisputable. These two are to be discussed and agreed upon in what the group calls the forum of expert opinion. A second important theme in the group's reflection was the conception of unifying psychology, a field that now split into numerable schools his approach into this gigantic task was to strive for arrangements of the definitions of basic concepts in scientific psychology. The group conceded that the task of bridging methodological and terminological differences between schools will not promise any er early success. However, connectability over terminology and method is a necessary requirement for any mature scientific discipline, he argued, working on it is a must. For many years, chess remained among his scientific interests with Dan Hartmap, Jap uh, van der Herrick, Fester Menderdorp, and the late IGM uh, Lutterweijic Prinz. He analyzed material based on the interviews with chess players, computer scientists, and social scientists on various aspects of the game of chess. <coughs> he, <coughs> pardon me. He published with me a book devoted to previously unpublished research on chess perception of memory. Finally, his research on Intuition used chess as an exemplar task domain. Up to 2000, De Groot was active. However, except for some occasional tournaments with friends and a few to correspondence game, competitive chess had disappeared from De Groot's life. He had remained very interested in the world of chess, in particular in computer chess. The International Computer Chess Association Journal being one of his favorite things to read on chess computers and on the uh, simulation of cognitive processes with computers, 
crude had a very strong position. Uh, both are useful and are likely to teach a great deal about computer science, psychology, and chess. However, both were, in his opinion, limited whenever intuition entered the picture. According to Groot, the vagueness and complexity of intuitive capabilities of highly experimental experts in the field were not amenable to programming. Groot, often with a smile on his face, always gave the impression of being a nice person. People say this because I'm an old professor. He used to joke, it is not hard. It is hard not to be taken by his conviction that life is fun. Fun was an example of uh, the book in Latin he once finished reading with his wife, Elsa. Fun was also the challenge offered by the sociology and philosophy of science research. Fun was to play games between chess computers and humans, even if computers won too often. So the mind of a chess player. Why should psychologists be interested in chess players? Besides the fact that it is for many of them an agreeable way of mixing their work and their favorite hobby, uh, some more persuasive reasons should be mentioned. First, chess is a difficult task requiring years of practice to be partly mastered. Second, chess is relatively easy to formulize. Third, there is a clear cut distinction in skill levels, both with the system of titles and with ELO ratings, the latter offering the advantage of being a quantitative measurement of skill. Button choice in chess, the foundations. Groot's thesis was motivated by two ambitious questions. First, how do the thought and decision processes of chess masters operate? Second, what are the differences in cognitive processing between chess grandmasters and candidate masters and amateurs? These two questions, when one substitutes chess masters by experts and chess amateurs by novices, are still highly topical and the focus of an active subfield of psychology. Chess folklore offers two contradictory answers. On the one hand, there is a conception that extraordinary capabilities of looking ahead and computation are the source of chess mastership. On the other hand, there is the stringent answer of Retty that when thinking about his next move, he did not look more than one move ahead. Selectivity, then, is the name of the game and not looking ahead. We have already described de Groot's main experimental procedure to ask subjects to think aloud when thinking about their next move as they would do in one of their games in a position previously unknown to them, a very simple experimental design indeed, which does not require more than a chessboard, a chess clock, and a paper and pencil to jot down subject statements. His subjects were six world-class players, four Dutch masters, five candidate masters, two female Dutch champions, and five weaker players. Not surprising, strong players did choose better moves than weaker players. The real question was how this choice took place. The group submitted the data uh, two kinds of analysis, quantitative and interpretive. The first type of analysis, the one that is almost exclusively mentioned in modern technical literatures, addressed mainly the question of the differences, if any, between experts and non-experts. The second type of analysis attempted to describe in detail how a choice was made by the players. Various measurements were taken from the protocol, such as the time to choose the best move, the number of different positions examined during the analysis, the number of different first moves proposed, and so on. Although there were about 20 variables, the huge surprise was that for most of these variables, there was no difference between masters and weaker players. In particular, strong players did not calculate significantly deeper than weaker players. The average maximum depth was 6.8 mo half moves for the grandmasters compared to 6.6 .6 half moves for the candidate masters and 5.5 .5 half moves for the weaker players. Even for variables that differed between levels of skill, the absolute differences were minimal and could hardly be used to explain the huge variation in the quality of moves chosen. Finally, it was clear that most subjects were very selective from the 30 or so positions, possible moves that White could play in given positions. They mostly investigated three or four of them. Most of the book, however, was devoted to a qualitative analysis of the structure of the decision processes in relation to Otto Zelt's theory of problem solving. A first result in the protocols was the subjects investigated the same continuation of several times, either immediately or after having directed their attention to a different variation. The process which the group named progressive deepening seems to operate both due to limitations in human processing capacities and because it allows newly discovered information to be integrated with previous variations. Progressive deepening is also a result of the cyclic organization of chess players' thought, which may be characterized as a sequence of observation test evaluation phases. As larger cycles may include smaller cycles as means of dealing with subproblems, a player's thought may be described as complex hierarchies of problems and subproblems. Groot argued that progressive deepening is evidence in chess characteristics, most complex goal, direct thought and choice processes, scientific activity included.
The group proposed also that a player's thinking process may divide it into four main phases, orientation, exploration, investigation, and proof. In the orientation phase, players collect relevant information and try to form a first tentative judgment of the position. During the exploration phase, sample variations are analyzed and typically the number of critical moves or plans is reduced to two. The two candidate moves are analyzed in great detail during an investigation phase, which is characterized by more in-depth searching uh, than during the exploration phase. Players strive to validate their favorite move or plan. Note that the most of the argumentation used by chess players consists of convincing themselves that one of the two variations is better than the other. Finally, the proof phase is used to recapitulate the information obtained in the analysis and to check the correctness of the argumentation. The group described also several chess methods used by player to reach their solution. These methods include strategic and tactical plans, ideas, and goals. Note that while they differentiate well between strong and weak players, all these methods are tied to the domain of chess. The higher level thought and choice methods which organize the structure of the protocol did not differ between players of various skills. In summary, masters choose better moves because not because they search more deeply or visit more nodes in the tree of search, but because they select better lines for further investigation, they evaluate the final position with a variation better, and they apply better chess methods to solve the problem at hand. All these findings point not to a difference in carrying out the search, but to a difference in knowledge and also in perception. Masters are normally able to zoom in rapidly during the exploration phase to the critical elements of the position. In order to test this hypothesis, the group carried out a simple experiment, which was to yield spectacular results. Paradoxically, only 12 pages buried in the chapter on chess talent are devoted to this experiment, which has since been applied to other domains and is now referred to as the group's recall experiment. Positions were shown for a small amount of time, 2 to 15 seconds, and the subjects then had to reconstruct the position as accurately as possible. As noted before, the results were stunning. Grandmasters were able to reproduce correctly almost the entire position, or else weaker players could retain only a few pieces. A more qualitative result was that the masters were able to understand the gist of the position very rapidly, even with a presentation time below five seconds. More about chess players' perception. After an interlude, of about 20 years, De Groot again took up the questions of chess players' memory and perception. This topic was the thesis of Riken Jongman's, a student of his. Besides replicating some of the 1946 book data, Jordan had two goals in mind. First, he wanted to know how remarkable was the performance of chess masters. Second, he wanted to pin down more precisely a question of chess perception. What do chess players really see during the five-second exposure to a position? Answering the question of master's performance is tantamount to establishing how much information is contained in a chess position. If the quantity of information expressed in bits or number of possible binary choices is huge, then the performance of masters is truly amazing. In contrast, if the masters are able to see the position in such a way that it's coded economically, taking advantage of the redundancy of the position, then the quantity of information is more, more manageable size and the master's performance is not so surprising. An example of redundancy is offered by the English language, which has a redundancy of about 75%. For instance, the probability of an N following the letter TIO, TIO is very high in English. Using various experimental techniques, DeGroote and Zhongwen found that chess positions are very redundant for chess masters. Therefore, masters do not need a huge processing capacity to recall a chess position. Chess redundancy allows them to code the position efficiently. Instead of seeing 26 disconnected pieces on 64 independent squares, masters see a pan of attack of the Carroll Khan defense. It is then not a big deal for them to reconstruct the position afterwards. An interesting mixture of the two apparently incompatible methodologies was used by De Groot in his studies of the chess player's eye movements. In this experiment, eye movements were recorded during the five-second presentation of a chess position. And their attempt to reconstruct the position subjects were asked to retrospect on what they had seen during the exposure time. Results show that while not perfect, master's retrospective descriptions agreed uh, with where the eyes had looked. These descriptions also offered information on where masters directed their attention. This information would not be gained only through the eye fixations and latency times and allows one to integrate the qualitative data into a consistent story. Comments also shed a useful light on what masters do when they are confronted with weird positions, positions they cannot categorize rapidly. The analysis of eye movement showed clear differences between novices and masters. The lattice, lattice fixations are faster and smoother. In addition, masters zero in rapidly on important squares. They literally see a different position. 
Interesting masters use simple visual cues to direct their eye movements to critical squares. For example, a white pawn that has entered black's territory is conspicuous visual property of the position, but is almost always a valid cue to the chess meaning of the position. Diagram one depicts a middle game position. In figure one, we can see the eye movement of a master and a novice. Um, the master on the left and the novice on the right. Note that masters perform more visual, more fixations, and he covers more squares than the novice. Note also that the master rapidly directed his attention to the white king side, uh, characterized by the presence of an advanced and conspicuous black pawn. So you see the master first starts with the dot towards the center, then goes looking towards uh, the pawn, and then around the sides, as opposed to the weaker player who starts looking here, then looks towards the end of the board and doesn't look anywhere else. Non-standard approach. De Groot's approach to psychology is complex. It is a subtle mixture of hard techniques, mathematical and statistical. Do not forget that he was a professor of methodology for over 20 years and of softer approaches such as interpretive analysis of verbal protocols. In this case, the psychologist tries to understand the subject's behavior at several levels, some of which are not accessible through sheer quantitative techniques. His work on chess, starting with his thesis, offers a good example of the concomitant applications of these two approaches. A brief glimpse of the history of psychology may be useful to study the group's approach. At the turn of the century, Germany was the world center of psychology. Important school was introspectionism, whose main source of data were verbal protocols collected by subjects highly trained in inspecting their own mental states. Note that most texts used by introspectionists were exceedingly simple. For example, the pressing of a button when hearing a tone and the yield of information had little to do with more complex processes of thought and decision-making. The atomism, however, was overcome step-by-step, step, meaning by Oswald Culp's uh, Wurzburg's group, from which later Otto Seltz's uh, Denk Psychology, Psychology of Thought, emerged. Zelt's main research tool was systematic introspection in an experimental setting. The work of Zeltz inspired De Groot in his treatment of chess thought. De Groot met Zeltz in person in the late 1938 when Zeltz landed in Amsterdam as a refugee from Nazi Germany. In the United States, the early 20s saw violent reaction to these schools with the behavioralism movement. One of its tenets was that anything that could not be observed or measured had no place in scientific psychology. Exit then introspection. Some of the favorite domains of study of uh, dank psychology of uh, thought and psychology, such as problem solving, almost completely disappeared from American universities where emphasis was given to research on learning and the study of very simple tasks, such as the memory of nonsense syllables and learning uh, by rats and mazes that were amenable to clear-cut experimental manipulations. It was not until the late 50s that a counter-revolution was launched by the so-called cognitive psychology movement, which emphasized the non-observable concepts may also be stated scientifically. Think, for example, of the concept of gravity in physics and deplored a lack of relevance of most work done by behaviorals. This brand of cognitive psychology still dominates psychology nowadays. The approach taken by De Groot in his thesis and his later work on chess is a typical example of Zeltzian uh, dank psycholo psychology at the theoretical level the claim is that thought processes may be seen as a chain of mental operations carried out by the subject. Each operation occurs as a consequence both of the problem at hand and of the results of the previous operation. According to Zeltz, thinking was made possible not by the recognition of previously learned associations, but by the applications of solving methods that may be applied to different types of problems. At the empirical level, verbal protocols are used to support or invalidate the theory. In addition to such Zeltzian methodology, De Groot had used already in his thesis quantitative data analysis to corroborate his theoretical claims. It is a mixture of two approaches at first sight incompatible where the originality of his work resides. Criticism have been leveled against introspectionism and protocol analysis, focusing mainly on the subjectivity and rationalization process present in such data. To these, the group replied that psychology discipline that does not ask subjects about what they think are doing misses something very important, as they are the best experts on their own mental life. In his opinion, data gathered from protocols can be used as any other data to test theories. Many hard science theories and psychology behavioralistic theories first would not pass this test there too much at variance with what the subject reports to have done. Nowadays, the official cognitive psychology has accepted 
the use of concurrent protocols, but not of retrospective protocols nor introspection. A rapid pursuer of the more recent literature on chess psychology shows that experimenters are interested mainly in qualitative, quantitative results, percentage of pieces placed correctly, number of errors in a recall task, number of moves analyzed, depth of search, and problem solving tasks, but that very few of them bother to ask subjects to comment on their own performance and to describe, for example, the strategies they use. In addition, most research have accepted the theoretical proposal of Chase and Simon that masters perceive chess positions not as a gestalt, but as chunks of pieces. From this perspective, the success of thought in chess, choice in chess is somewhat paradoxical. Current psychology has retained from this study mainly the quantitative results results that de Groot used only to illustrate his thinking of his theory of thinking. Interesting, none of the researchers of chess psychology gave much credit to de Groot's painstaking description of chess players' thinking, and it's true that thought and choice in chess was written in a tradition which in America had been wiped out by behavioralism, and Europe slowly faded during the second quarter of the century and has since fallen into oblivion. In the later phases of his life, de Groot pointed, reminded uh, us that scientific psychology has much to gain by employing some of the soft techniques advocated in dank psychology approach. History may prove that DeGroote correct. After all, in the last two decades, there has been a renewal of interest in more qualitative ways of analyzing chess data. There has been a revival of interest, too, in higher descriptions of the global descriptions of positions besides the more detailed descriptions at the chunk level. Obviously, this is the level you get when you ask experts to speak about their field and expertise, and this is the level of analysis DeGroote emphasized in thought and choice in chess. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. And uh, um, Regina, chess, good game, good way to improve your mental thought and decision making abilities. So, uh, you know, interesting also to look at the long history range of uh, psychology and, and how things were looked at you know, back in a time to now and you know now where you know almost everything is statistics and neuro neuroscience um back in the day like you know we just asked people what, what was what was going through their mind and then you get the pushback he's like i don't even care what was going through their mind it makes absolutely no difference what was going through their mind and you look at those questions like free will it's saying like there is no such thing as free will it does not matter what you think is the reason why you did something um, you know, there's overarching cognitive processes and reasons. And so um, um, that's why I thought chess would be something interesting to talk about. Yes, I have videos prepared on reincarnation since you're there and you're mentioning high T. I have uh, I've already prepared and read through, like hopefully, pr probably not for a good few weeks or month till I'm going to do my uh, video and it's going to be more in the Jewish understanding of reincarnation, and you know, if it has Jennifer, you know, she's holding anywhere on, on producing a video and uh, on, on that topic. Okay, so let's go further. Um, this is probably one of the most famous books ever written, and especially for people who seriously want to get better at chess. And it's an older book, so it's free. You know, you can get a free copy online. Think Like a Grandmaster by um, Alexander Kotov. And you know, the famous uh, Russian school, and uh, sorry, trying to page right here. Okay, so let's just look at a little of this uh, words here from Think Like a Grand Grandmaster, extremely famous book, and. Uh, this is more from the introspection, like a meditative process. If someone, you know, you know, like I'm not focusing this video on how to become a better chess player, but from a certain perspective, it's like meditation. The way to become a better chess player is to actualize better control of our own minds. And so this, you know, like the group, what are you saying? You know, what's the difference between how a better chess player uh, finds a better move than a worse one? And so this is the most, you know, probably famous book, Think Like a Grandmaster. I'm only going to look at very parts of it. And he has this concept of analysis trees. Um, let's just look. Uh, an immense number of books have been written on chess. Some chess writers annotate recent games. Others compile and bring up-to-date works on opening variations. But strange as it may seem, no one has the idea of describing the methods by which the leading players of our time have reached the peak 
of their playing strength. Yet a study of these methods would greatly facilitate the process of mastering the intricacies of the game. Uh, nowadays, there's tons of books like that. Uh, in the book, the author describes how Botvinnik, Kyle, Smyslov, uh, Trojan, Karaz, and Bronstein, many other leading grandmasters studied chess theories and trained themselves to understand the mysteries of chess strategy and tactics. They themselves have revealed some of their methods in articles and game annotations, while well, I have become acquainted with others from personal conversations with my fellow grandmasters. The reader will also find an account of my own personal experience. My achievements in the field of chess are the result of immense hard work in studying theory, and I flatter myself that his experience will prove to be of interest to the reader. Chess is a complex game, yet millions of enthusiasts are fascinated by it. Some of them reach the playing strength of the first or second category player, where others are satisfied to be known all their life as a beginner. Yet surely even a weak player would like to win a chess title and be known as master, even grandmaster. If someone could only show them how to reach this goal, then many of these enthusiasts would be prepared to set off along the long and irksome road of tournament play with all its exciting and nerve-wracking experiences. How then does one become a grandmaster? In the case that a strong player's ability and are purely natural and that hard work cannot change anything. Naturally, there must be some inherent ability, but as in other spheres of human endeavor, the main factor is immense, unstinting effort to master the skills of chess strategy and tactics. The great chess master Emmanuel Lasker asserted that in the space of 100 hours, he could produce a first category player from a young man of average ability. Could one go further than that? Lasker never had an occasion to prove the validity of his claim. The many questions naturally arise. Um, could one, by dint of careful study and hard work, go as far as becoming a master or even a grandmaster? My own experience tells me that such study and hard work do lead to immense improvements in one's practical results. So about going over his personal achievements, my desire to make this book as clear and helpful as possible has led me to employ new names for some strategic laws and concept. This was not done in an attempt to try for an unnecessary scientific approach, but merely to help the memorization of important points. The book makes use of a large extent of the games and advice of the Soviet grandmasters who belong to what is now called the older generation. The reason for this is that all of my chess career, um, the book contains games by the author. So let's read a little bit more of this. We shall now try to describe the complex process of thinking which takes place in a grandmaster's mind during play. To explain his thought process as clearly as possible, let us try a little experiment that was suggested to me in the method of studying mechanics in high school. First of one studies statics, the effect of forces on a body at rest, then dynamics in which the same phenomena are studied in motion. So too, we shall first consider how to think about moves from the static point of view, and then later in the book from the dynamic. Let us imagine the room where top class tournament is being played. Let us go onto the stage and ask one of the players um, to give us his uh, seat. Let us now uh, you know, tell us straight away without any further consideration the course of his thought as he studies the position in which he is to move. I cannot be certain that his first reaction would be to count how many pawns there are, as a rule of grandmasters can take in at a glance without counting how many pieces there are. However, he may at times also count the pieces. We now assume that... Uh, so anyone more interested, I, I would really recommend... Uh, the whole book and his contribution here to chess is probably these you know things that now are very common the analysis tree and the idea of the candidate move where you're in a given chess position and you see that there's a certain amount of possible moves and then replies and replies to that and so you have a series like okay it's my turn right now i have to make a move and these are the the ideas that i'm looking at I mean, so DeGroote is basically, you know, basing it all, uh, scanning it and saying like two different variations. And uh, so this is a classic of chess literature, only loosely on the periphery of what I was talking to. But I wanted to bring it up and anyone that, uh, you know, seriously wants to think about it. And, and just as like a meditative expert on how to become a better thinker, even if you're not a chess player, um, I, I would say like as a book on meditation on how to become a better thinker, think like a grandmaster could be considered one of the greatest uh, you know, books ever written. Here is, uh, we mentioned this in the article. Here, I'll put this in the link. I'll also encourage people to read this whole 
article, the Journal of Psychology in 1907 by Alfred Cleveland that uh, we had mentioned in the psychology of the game of chess. Um, you know, different uh, aspects, the emotional effects of play, personal temperamental difference of player, attainment of players, average ability, ability to plan moves ahead, visual imagination, ability to take in large sections of the board, reconstruction of the status of an unfinished game, position sense, different grades of chess players, attainment of chess masters. So uh, Bill Hall in his uh, you know article that I read first covered quite a bit of this, but let's just get a few words here from this uh, Alfred Cleveland in 1907. In this study, an attempt is made to sketch the psychology Okay, so I just try to make it a little larger. Uh, in this study, an attempt is made to sketch the psychology of the game of chess to trace the stages of the development of chess player and to interpret the progress in psychological terms. That the task owing to the complexity of the process involved and the impossibility of applying anything like satisfactory objective tests is a difficult one and obvious, but is one that seems the writer to the writer worth attempting. Psychology of chess. Chess is, as everyone knows, a mimic battle fought upon a field of 64 squares with pieces moving according to an elaborate system and having power suggestive of a variety of fighting units. The purpose of chess, uh, each player is to checkmate his opponent, that is to hem him in, threaten the latter's king in such a fashion that he's subject to capture the next move. In our discussion on psychology of the game, it will be, be convenient to consider first as a form of human play and then to take up more uh, particularly the mental powers involved. Chess is a form of human play, forms and varieties of the game. The game of chess has not been confined to any particular age, race, country, or class. It is without doubt one of the oldest, if not the oldest, of the intellectual pastimes. It is a game of skill par excellence. Its origin is not definitely known, and there have been many claims to the honor of its invention, especially in the latter history of the game has developed a number of offshoots and specialties which were Many people share the interest of play across the board. The chief of these is the composition and solving of the chess problems, which now has quite literature and many devotees. Another is the correspondence play, in which strict rules of a typical game are somewhat relaxed on account of the peculiar conditions of play. Others practice such feats, but especially psychological interest or blindfold play, to which Binet has devoted special research and the playing of many games at once. To some of these special form, we shall return later. Instinctive factors in chess playing. Chess is, as we have said, a game where distributive and uh, wide distribution and popularity. Dr. Emmanuel Laster states that over 1 million English speaking pe people know the game, that they're in the United States, England, Canada, between seven and 800 good sized chess clubs, many of which have over 100 members each. In the city of London, chess has over 400 members. Um, judging from the number of chess clubs, chess periodic Goals and players of high rank in Germany, France, and Russia, Austria, and Poland. Chess is no less popular in those countries. If one were to ask what chess uh, class or classes of people play chess, one might truthfully reply that uh, all classes play it. The question then arises, why is chess proved so widely popular at all times and all places? How has it been possible for a game making severe intellectual demands to hold a place historically and in geographically distribution besides such universal forms of human play as gambling, horse racing, athletics, hunting, and to claim devotees, if less numerous, at any rate as loyal as any of these? The answer is, of course, that in common with a multitude of other games and sports, it appeals to the fundamental instinct of combat in a way that is direct and at the same time exempt from the antisocial features that are inherent in actual physical combat. Here lies a large share of its attractiveness and its capacity for stirring emotion. It takes hold upon these suppressed survivals of savage impulse, which in their modified exercise have been shown to have a large factor in adult sport. In this, however, it shows, but the typical qualities of the genus to which it belongs, that is one of the strongly competitive games. Its own specific attractiveness lies in the fact that it's a competitive game of skill, more particularly of intellectual skills opposed to merely manual or bodily dexterity. 
in its contest of scheme against scheme. It is a game of generalship. Each particular situation appeals to the player not only as an occasion for attack or defense, but also as a situation to be met by talking through a difficulty to be seen through and overcome a problem to be solved. There is therefore in chess playing all of the challenge that lies in battling and baffling but fascinating problems and much of the, which lies in the solution of puzzles that the interest of the aspect of chess is real and important is abundantly evidenced by the growth of chess problems of which we shall have more to say presently. Lindley's study of puzzles holds it likely that in the puzzle solving passion we have a form of the preparatory play impulse to which groups rightly attribute so much both animals and human play. Still another factor of interest is chess is the pleasure of invention and origination, the pleasure of being a cause. In the returns of my correspondence, a decided preference is expressed for original plans of attack and defense. Most say that they get away from the standard book play as soon as possible after the first few moves. Some say that they play from a book not from choice but from necessity, but most say that while they follow book openings for a few moves, they prefer to get away from them as soon as they possibly can without detriment to their game. They prefer their own game because it's more real and a better representative of their own ideas. As one player put it, there's little satisfaction in catching your opponent in a line of play that you have simply memorized. There are also, of course, various practical reasons for this preference. An original plan throws both players on their merits and removes the game at once, so far as possible for a mere memory exercise, thus depriving the player of the advantage of superior memory or a better knowledge of book games might give. There's an advantage to the player himself in an original plan in that his game is more likely to be a unit and consequently more consistently played than one partly remember and partly originate. While the inability to remember particular lines of play is undoubtedly a determining factor in the choice between an original plan and what is known as book play, nevertheless, there is something attractive about a game which one feels to be his own, especially if it is successful. In summary, we may say of chess as a form of human play, then the first place it is a contest, and as such, it appeals to the fundamental fighting instinct, the instinct which in every normal individual impels him to measure his skill with that of others. In a second place, chess offers its devotees opportunity to exercise their ingenuity in the solution of problems and puzzles a form of pleasure that may well rest upon the general interest of the unknown, which at one time may have had the greatest survival value. It would seem further that an intellectual activity is indulged in for the pleasure which such activity is given itself and sport of this kind, perhaps an expression of the general play instinct. Intelligence, as Lindley holds, no exception to the law of exercise, just as those animals, which by fortunate variation were born with a tendency to indulge in pre uh, preliminary exercise of those activities, which were to serve the serious ends of adult life, were favored by natural selection, and were able to transmit such advantages in the form of general play instincts. So in more special ways, these creatures endowed with the strongest tendencies to exploit the intelligence may have perpetrated the superiority of general intellectual play instinct. Again, the chess strategy of an individual is largely the product of his own brain. It is his own and merely as such is interesting to him, no matter where or how he got his knowledge of the game. If he is anything of a player, he has assimilated it and made it part of his mental self and his game in turn reflects something of his personality. There's also what might be termed secondary derived or aesthetic interest in chess namely in the finer and subtler points of the game in what the chess world calls its brilliancies. Appreciation of the consequent admiration for the skill of others is a contributory element in this pleasure. And finally, it is notwithstanding its own exacting demands, a means of mental relaxation and is such attractive to the mental worker. General features of chess from a psychological point of view, the emotional effects of play. We have already alluded incidentally to the emotions which may be stirred by the chess combat. The desire to win is fundamentally connected with the fighting instinct. Young and ardent players especially find the elation and victory of bitterness of defeat by no means small. They work hard at the game and feel the outcome in proportion to their efforts. The chess manuals and the magazines repeat suggestions on how one should wear his laurels or accept defeat, but in spite of this well-intended advice, every chess club has its members who invariably make excuses every lost game. A good many players, however, have the sportsman feeling strongly developed and are not unpleasantly affected if they 
are conscious of having played well. They do not enjoy winning if their victory is the result of a fluke on their own part or a palpable oversight on the part of their opponent. Personal and temporal difference in players. The opinion in general among chess players that a man's temperament enters into his play and determines its style. Many of my correspondents state that they have recognized and often utilize this factor in actual play by forcing an opponent to adapt a line of play for which he is unfitted by temperament. For example, a slow, careful game is played against an aggressive and daring player who is often provoked by these Fabian tactics into recklessness and loss. Chess players are also very firm in the belief that one's game is an index of his character in a wider sense, and that no one will be likely to deny that the fundamental traits of character are revealed in unimportant matters, especially when one becomes so deeply absorbed that he forgets all else. Chess offers such an opportunity for deep absorption and is not unreasonable to suppose that one's uh, real rather than his conventional character will reveal itself. Attainments of players of average experience. In order for some conception of the skill and knowledge which a chess player of average experience possesses, let us consider his ability to plan moves ahead and to anticipate those of his opponent to dis entangle a complicated situation to reconstruct the status of an unfinished game from memory and last his positional sense. So uh, Wall in his post covered a bunch of this, so I'm, I'm not going to read through all of this. It's 40 pages, a lot of uh, interesting uh, stuff here. Um, sure, I mean, he goes through, so there's the psychology of learning the game. How a person goes about learning that Hull had mentioned. People want to, you know, go about that uh, more in depth. You know, they, like Piaget's start, you know, stages of learning. And this over a hundred years ago. And there's also a little bit of a note about uh, imbeciles who uh, become reasonably good at chess and the uh, implications for connections between chess and intelligence by the fact that there are extremely low intelligent people that have been able to demonstrate mastery of chess. Okay, so let's look at uh, two of these famous articles that we mentioned here. This is the famous one that uh, introduces this concept of chunking in chess the, 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 that we talked about in my video on speed reading. And uh, this chunking concept is going to be important to my multiple truth hypothesis, multiple axiom hypothesis, and uh, how the brain puts together thought. And, uh, you know, chess is a good example, like speed reading, where I mentioned, the, you know, the basis of speed reading is, you know, as a, as a young kid, you, you write the P-E-R-C-O perception as a uh, you know, more trained person, you know, in one word could see perception. And then uh, as a chunk, you know, in one intake, you can see perception in chess and conceivably more, you could even see like a whole page in one intake through this concept of chunking. And it's saying this same concept that uh, I've talked about in speed reading is applicable to chess. So I'm not going to read this whole paper. And we've already covered quite a bit of uh, the, the thesis of this. But uh, you know, just for those people more academic, um, you know, here's the actual perception in chess by Chase and Simon. Paper develops a technique for 1973. Perception in chess, Chase and Simon. Paper develops a technique for isolating and studying the perceptual structures that chess players perceive. Three chess players of varying strength from master to novice were confronted with two tasks, a perception task where the player reproduces a chess position in plain view, and a group short-term recall task where the players reproduce a chess position after viewing it for five seconds. The successive glances at a position in the perceptual task and long pauses of the memory task were used to segment the structures in the reconstruction protocol the size and nature of these structures were then analyzed as a function of chess skill. What does an experienced chess player see when he looks at the chess position? By analyzing the expert player's eye movement, it has been shown that, among other things, he is looking at how pieces attack and, and defend each other. But we also know from other considerations that he's seeing much more. Our work is considered with just what the expert chess player perceives. The most extensive work on date to this perception in chess is that done by the de Groot and his colleagues in his search for differences between masters and weaker players. The group was unable to find any gross differences in the statistics of their thought processes, the number of moves considered, search heuristics, depth of search, and so on. Masters searched through about the same number of possibilities as weaker player, perhaps even fewer, almost certainly not more. They are all very good at coming up with the right moves 
for further consideration, whereas weaker players spend considerable time analyzing consequences of bad moves. Drew did, however, find an intriguing difference between masters and weaker players in a short-term memory experience, uh, experiments. Um, masters showed a remarkable ability to reconstruct a chess position almost perfectly after viewing it for only five seconds. There was a sharp drop-off in the ability for players below the master level. The result could not be attributed to the master's general superior memory ability for when chess positions were constructed by placing the same number of pieces. Random in the board, the masters could do no better in reconstructing than weaker players. Hence, the masters appear to be constrained by the same severe short-term memory limits as everyone else. And the superior performance with meaningful positions must lie in their ability to perceive structure in such positions to encode them in chunks. Specifically, if chess masters can remember the location of 20 or more pieces on the board, but has space for only about five chunks in short-term memory, then each chunk must be composed of four or five pieces organized in a simple relational structure. One key to understanding chess mastery then seems to lie in the immediate perceptual processing, for it is here that the game is structured and is here that the static analysis that the good moves are generated for subsequent processing behind this perceptual analysis as with all skills lies an extensive cognitive apparatus amassed math through years of constant practice what was once accomplished by slow conscious deductive reasoning is now arrived at by fast unconscious perceptual processing it is no mistake of language for the chess master to say that he sees the right move and it is for good reason that students of complex problem solving are interested in perceptual processes. Our main concern here is to discover and characterize the structures or chunks that are seen on the board and stored in short-term memory. Previous studies of chess perception make highly plausible the hypothesis that the chess master encodes information about a position in chunks, but provide no direct methods for delimiting the chunk boundaries or detecting the relations that hold among the components of a chunk. Evidence is needed on these points in order to discover how many pieces typically constitute a chunk, what are the relative sizes of the chunks of masters and weaker players, and how many chunks players retain after a brief period, a uh, brief view of the position. The player's perceptual processing of the board is so rapid and probably unavailable to conscious introspection that it is impossible to obtain an accurate verbal description of the process from him. Although eye movements give us a record of how the board is scanned, they do not tell us precisely which pieces are observed in which order. They only tell us the general area being aimed at by the fovea. And of course, data on eye movements can tell us what information is being abstracted from the display. There are however, other techniques which have been used uh, with verbal materials that would appear promising from the problem at hand. Tolving has looked at clusters of free recall protocols and Bowers and Springton have looked at the timing relations and pauses of the input. McLean and Greg have used pauses to define chunks in rote learning. Aindor has studied chunking of visual stimuli in the form of Chinese ideograms using a method essentially identical with our perception experiment. The central objective of this study then is to isolate and define the chunks into which information is hypothesized to be encoded in chess perception tasks. We use two techniques in the perception task. We ask the chess players to reconstruct the chess position while it remains in plain view. And we use subjects' uh, suggestive glances at the board as an index of chunking. The basic assumption is that under the conditions of the experiment, the subject will encode only one chunk per glance while reconstructing the position. In the memory task, which is very similar to the group task, we ask chess players to reconstruct the position from memory after brief exposure to it. And we use the timing of clustering and recall to segment the output into chunks. Memory task permits us to replicate the basic findings of de Groot and Jongman. These results are so important that it is essential to have an independent replication. Moreover, the empirical results in the case by the random boards have never been reported in detail in the literature. By using two different tasks, we obtain some protection against the artifacts that might compromise the interpretation of other findings. One important question we shall investigate is whether the chunks defined by the data from the perception task are essential of the same size and character of the chunks defined by the data of the memory task. In the following section of this paper, we will report and analyze the main body of data obtained by presenting the two tasks uh, to a chess master and to weaker players. Then we investigate in some greater detail the data from the chess masters in the middle game position. The final section will summarize our findings and interpretation of them. So I'm going to skip the method and the task and uh, their results. Just say here, um, various tasks. I, I'll encourage people to uh, read this thoroughly through themselves, but uh, we've covered quite a bit. Here's like a graph of a uh, you know, number of pieces on the board, uh, an accuracy of the comparison of uh, um, beginners, uh, middle players, and advanced players in terms of correctly placing p 
cases, uh, versus the number of trials, a difference between positions of the game, and uh, the difference uh, time interval timer intervals making, and all these include uh, the difference of these tasks between uh, the various uh, classes of players. And uh, a whole bunch of data here, a whole bunch of charts. Uh, encourage people who want to know more about it to read through this. I, I read through this uh, multiple times already, but you know, time is limited, and uh, there's a lot to get through. So let me just get to the conclusion here. Having segmented the re recall protocol into chunks, we now are in a position to test the hypothesis that recall is limited by the number of chunks that can be held in short-term memory. We interpret this hypothesis to mean that M superior recall should be associated that a master superior recall should be associated with larger chunks, but that the number of chunks should be a small constant within a memory span. One problem with this analysis must be dealt with first. The recall protocols generally consist of two phases. Um, We observe first that chunk size is related to chess skill for the first few chunks, but then the difference disappears in later chunks of the protocol. This relation is less true of the end game positions, and chunks are also smaller for the end games. The middle game and end game difference simply reflect the fact that end games are less structured than middle games. The gradual drop in chunk size during recall could be due to several things. First, it may be that the subjects simply recall their larger chunks first. Second, it is well known that recall has an interfering effect on short-term memory, and it may be that interference causes large chunks to break up into smaller chunks that some of the relations are forgotten. Third, the later chunks may be contaminated by some of the piece-by-piece -piece reconstructions that are uh, missed by our criterion. Perhaps the first guesses are the best and more likely to be correct. We observe second that the average number of chunks for each subject is well within the memory span as hypothesized, but contrary to our ex expectation, the number of chunks is related to chess skill. Taking at face value, the data suggests that M achieves his superior performance by recalling both more chunks and larger chunks. This seems a rather surprising result. We know the performance on randomized positions that the masters do not have a superior memory capacity. Uh, wherever then do these extra chunks come from? There are at least two possibilities. First, it may be that M does not store a small number of unrelated chunks in short-term memory. Rather, he may be able to organize the chunks on the board in some and yet undetermined way so that more chunks can be stored. In this way, A, M might get more information from the partially reconstructed board than the weaker players about the rest of the, what the rest of the position should be. In other words, the data should make us skeptical of an overly simple theoretical position that postulates short-term memory consists of a linear set of seven or so unrelated chunk slots. The second possibility discussed earlier is that Master is reconstructing part of the position from his general knowledge of such positions and our criterion for these reconstructions doesn't pick up all the responses because they're more likely to be correct for a master than from other players. And some of the data on chunk size and memory span confirm the hypothesis that chunk size is larger for more skilled chess players and the number of chunks is within the memory span. However, the hypothesis that the number of chunks is invariant over different levels of chess skills is not supported. Perceptual chunks of a chess master, de Gruden Young have made several observations of the nature of the perceptual chunks into which grandmasters and masters encode information. In their experiments, however, the author had no objective means for detecting chunk boundaries. Our data gave us an operational method of characterizing chunks, which we will apply to the middle game memory experiments of subject M. Table nine shows for M the size of successive chunks in the five middle game In nine puzzle positions for trial one of the memory experiments, the great bulk of the 77 chunks in those 14 positions belong to a very small number of types. Of the 77 chunks, only 17 couldn't be classified into the following three categories, pawn chains, castle king position, or cluster pieces of the same color. Over half of the chunks contained in pawn chains, sometimes with a nearby supporting piece, and sometimes with blockading pieces or containing more than one of these categories, for example, a castle king position, a strong and often used defensive structure, sometimes with the nearby pieces, 
27 chunks consist of clusters of pieces of the same color, exclusive of Castle King uh, positions, and 18 of these were familiar types. Nine chunks consisted of pieces on the back rank, uh, often in their original undeveloped positions, and nine chunks consisted of connected rooks mutually supporting or the queen connected with one or two rooks, a very powerful attacking structure. These categories are not mutually exclusive since some chunks contain more than one of these categories. For example, a castle king position also contains a pawn chain, and sometimes a pawn chain and a cluster of pieces occur within the same chunk. The point is, however, that over 75% of the chunks belong to only three types of chessboard configurations, all highly familiar and stereotyped. One further analysis was carried out by M's protocol for an examination of the chess relations, it appears that the subjects were not attending to the attack relation as much as the defense relation. Recall that the attack relation appeared more often than chance only if the attacking pieces were also on adjacent squares, but a casual look at M's protocols indicated that some attacking pieces were clustered in his protocols. Therefore, to test this hypothesis more objectively, the 14 middle game and puzzle positions were analyzed by the authors to find the strongest attacks. 18 such attacks were found, consisting mostly of pieces attacking the opponent's king position. Of the 18 attacks, 11 were chunked in M's protocol. In this sense, that at least two of the attacking pieces appeared within the same chunk. Rarely did the attack pieces also appear in the same chunk with the attackers. Of the 11 attacks, six consisted of rooks and queen rook combination. One chunk also contained a pawn in combination with a queen and rook. The other five chunks consisted of a knight in combination with a queen or rook. Plus, it appears that there are two kinds of attack that get chunked. The first kind is a fortuitous attack characterized by an attack relation between two adjacent pieces. The second kind is attack that is more abstract and involves combinations of pieces of the same color converging usually on the opponent's king position. The relationship between the attacking pieces wouldn't appear as an attack relation. These pieces would either have no relation or defense relation. These attack chunks would also be stereotype often involved in classic maneuvers against a stereotype defensive position. M would be able to recall all these chunks provided that he has stored in long-term memory a modest vocabulary of variant patterns for each of half dozen types of configuration. The estimates given in Simon and Barfield as the size of vocabulary required to appear um, now to be, if anything, somewhat too large. Thus, we can account for M's performance in recalling positions he has seen for only five seconds if we postulate the short-term memory of, of average capacity but long-term memory capability of recognizing one, a variety of chunks consisting of pawns and possibly rook and minor pieces in common castle king configuration. Two, a variety of chunks consisting of common first rank configurations. Three, a variety of chunks consisting of common pawn chain, rook pair, and rook and queen configurations. And four, a variety of common configurations of attacking pieces, especially along a file diagonal or around an opponent's castle king position. Conclusion. By confronting chess players of varying strength from master to novice with reception task and memory task, we've shown that the amount of information extracted from briefly exposed positions varies with playing strength, thus confirming early experiments of De Groot, Jongmin, and others. By measuring the time intervals between placements of successive pieces with the subjects attempted to reconstruct the positions, we were able to identify the boundaries of perceptual chunks. The data suggests that the superior performance of strong players which does not appear in random positions, derives from the ability of those players to encode the position into larger perceptual chunks, each consisting of a familiar sub-configuration of pieces. Pieces within a single chunk are bound by relations of mutual defense, proximity attack over small distance and common color and type. There is also some evidence that chunks may be held together by more abstract relations. There are more chunks in recall for the stronger players, yet the frequency of between chunk relations are all close to chance. This may derive from a hierarchical organization of the chunks related to chess skills that is more abstract than the simple chess relations we have measured. Further in M's protocol, there is good evidence that piece converging in the opponent's king position are chunked, a more abstract but fairly well-defined attack relation. Finally, the number of chunks retain short-term memory after brief exposure to chess positions about the magnitude we would predict from immediate recall of common words and copying of visual patterns. Okay, so there you have the famous Chase and Simon paper on chess um, memory. And so there, I have a lot of material on this. You see here all of this. Uh, these are all articles I haven't done. So I am going to go into the latest uh, details on um, what we know about this. These are more the important uh, historical papers in an overview of how chess is important to, uh, 
you know, the overall consciousness and then on, on a different stream or a different, you know, I'll, I'll talk about how um, this is related to the multiple truth hypothesis. Okay, so let's look at the uh, Gobit. I, I, you know, showed you Gobit's uh, paper on De Groot that I'd read earlier. So um, here's one of his famous papers on uh, chess players thinking revisited. So it's not his first paper, but uh, you know, later paper that has uh, more information. So the main result of Groot's 1946 classical study of chess players thinking was that players of various levels of skill do not differ in the macro structure of thought process, in particular with respect to the depth and search of the number of nodes investigated. Recently, Holdings challenged these results and proposed that there are skill differences in the way players explore the problem space. The present study replicates the Groot's problem-solving experience. Results show that masters differ from weaker players in more ways than found in the original study. Some of the differences support search models of chess thinking and others pattern recognition model. The theoretical discussion suggests that the usual distinction between search and pattern recognition models of chess thinking is unwarranted and proposed is a way of reconciling the two approaches. What is the key to ex expertise? Over the years, psychologists have proposed two main explanations, ability to access a risk knowledge database through pattern recognition and ability to search through the problem space. Well, no researchers would stress the importance of one of these explanations to the exclusion of the other. The relative importance given to knowledge and search vary in current theories of skilled behavior. The tension between pattern recognition and search is clearly apparent in research on chess, a domain that has spawned numerous studies and whose results have shown to generalize well to other types of expertise. Chess offers several advantages as a domain of research, including rich and ecologically valid environment, quantitative measurement, scale of skill, large database of game, and cross-fertilization with research and artificial intelligence. Uh, basing their inquiry on DeGroote's uh, seminal study, Simon and Chase, who we just looked at, have given the most emphasis to selective search, to knowledge possessed by chess players, and to perception of memory mechanisms that allow them to rapidly access useful information. They propose that recognition processes allow search to be cut down typically to less than 100 nodes, and that search does not differ critically across skill levels. Evidence for this position, which is known as the chunking model, or as the pattern recognition theory, converges from several directions. First, the Groot's data show that more, most features in the macro structure of search, including the number of nodes visited and the depth of search, do not differ between top-level players and amateurs. Second, data from the speed chess and simultaneous chess show that strict limitations in thinking time do not impair expert performance much, as should be in the case of search for the key element of skill. Third, chess masters are highly selective and direct their attention rapidly to good moves. The group demonstrated that even chess grandmasters seldom look at more than 100 possible continuations of the game before choosing a move. Fourth, eye movement studies show that during the five-second exposure of a chess position, masters and novices differ on several dimensions, such as the mean and standard deviation of fixation duration and the number of squares fixated. In particular, max masters fixate more often squares that are important from a chess point of view, as retrospective protocols indicate that very little search is done during these five seconds. These differences suggest that perceptual pattern recognition processes allow masters to fixate relative squares, relevant squares more often. Based on Simon's chunking theory, where recognition of known pattern plays a key role, has been shown to apply relatively successfully in several other domains of expertise. Its main Weakness is the assumption, contrary to empirical evidence, that transfers from short-term memory to long-term memory is slow. Even with experts, a revision of chunking theory has removed this deficiency. In the conclusion of this paper, I will discuss how this theory of memory may apply to problem solving. Recently, Holding argued that the role of pattern recognition was overemphasized in the role of quantitative search, number of nodes visited, underplayed. Holding proposed three key features of chess expertise, search, evaluation of position, and knowledge. None of these elements are not at variance with what the chunking model proposes. For example, both approaches recognize the role of knowledge, and both predict that it was, was found in empirical research that strong chess players evaluate positions better, not only when the evaluation applies to a position on the board, but also when it applies to a position anticipated during search. It is relative important given to search that differentiates these two approaches. I refer to Holdings model 
and similar models give an emphasis uh, to look ahead search, such as models based on current chess computers as search models. Holding's main line of argumentation is that contrary to what was suggested by DeGroote, amount of search is a function of chess expertise. Strong players search deeper than weak players with respect to DeGroote's finding that top level grandmasters do not search reliably deeper than amateurs. Holding argues that experimental power may have been too low to on the experiment to detect existing differences. Holding also brings forward recent data which show that there is some difference in depth of search between weak and expert players. For example, Chern's data show a linear, small linear relation between ELO points and average depth of search. The search increases by about 0.5 ply for each standard deviation of skill. Note that in this study, as holding a Reynolds study, the best players were at best experts and therefore clearly weaker than the group's grandmasters who were world-class chess level players. To reconcile the results with DeGroote's turn, it's proposed the depth of search may not be linearly related to skill, but there's a ceiling of high skill level, possibly because search algorithms become uniform. Data collected by Saria Luma suggests that international masters and grandmasters search less than master players in tactical positions with a 10 minute limit for finding a move. Uh, both the number of nodes search and the mean depth of search show an interval U-curve function of skill with masters searching the largest nodes 52 and the largest depth 5.1 by comparison Solomon international master and grandmaster search on average through a space of 23 nodes with an average depth of 3.6 moves the relative role of search and chess expertise is theoretically important well beyond the realm of chess do decision makers rely more on analyzing various alternatives or on recognizing familiar patterns in the situation how do these two processes interact should the training of future experts from physicians to computer scientists lay most emphasis on analytical skill or on the building of huge knowledge databases and automatic access to it. Even though each domain of expertise may have idiosyncratic properties, research on chess may help identify some of the potential conditions under which search pattern recognition or some combination of both may be the best way to cope with complexities of the environment. It is therefore important to understand the role of search and chess expertise. Unfortunately, recent empirical data about are, are scarce about chess players thinking and no direct replication of group study is available in spite of its strong impact on cognitive psychology. Newell and Simon as well reckon and Oscuro used only a handful of subjects. Gruber had only two skill levels comparing novices to experts. Chern is the largest recent source of chess problem solving data used positions differently from the ones used by DeGroote and his experimental procedures differ somewhat in particular in limiting thinking time to 10 minutes, uh, which may affect variables such as depth of search. Because recent studies have used positions different from the ones used by DeGroote, it could be argued the difference found in depth of search are specific to the type of position used. Although DeGroote has suggested that most of the statistics he used were relatively stable from one position to another, Turner has found important differences in some of the variables used in his analysis. As a consequence of the current theoretical discussion about the role of search and the importance of the group's result and the lack of replication, I decided to submit data gathered for another purpose to secondary analysis. This permits replication with a large er, number of subjects of a subset of DeGroote's seminal study. The goal was to see whether DeGroote's results are robust in particular with respect to the passage of time. The replic replication of DeGroote's experiment described in this paper were carried out in 1986. The experiment served as a post-test in a study aimed at understanding the role of controllability in chess players, where controllability was defined as the degree to which subjects see a correlation between their actions and the outcome in the environment. Before being confronted with DeGroote's task, subjects were assigned three experimental groups, normal feedback group, manipulated feedback group, and control group, according to the type of controllability to which they were exposed. As the manipulation of controllability did not signify effect of any variant that would be discussed, later the data of the three groups will be pulled in this paper. Okay, so I'm not going to read through the method in his test. Here's the you know, quality of move chosen, total time, number of modes, the rate of generating nodes, the maximal and mean depth, the number of base moves, rate of generating base moves, number of episodes, duration of first phase, number of re-investigations, predicting quality of move after partially out search variables, comparison with DeGroote's results. Okay, a few qualifications required is the feasibility of comparing DeGroote's results with the Swiss results. First, there are slight differences in the way protocols. So DeGroote 
was mainly interested in high levels of expertise and focuses attention on comparisons between grandmasters and expert groups, a difference in skill about two standard deviations. His major finding was the macro structure protocols differ little across skill levels, at least with players having the minimal proficiency of expert. DeGroote states that the only clear differences were the grandmasters choose better moves, that they reach a decision sooner, and that they orient themselves faster in the position. In a reanalysis of DeGroote's results, Charnas mentions that there was also a statistical difference in the rate of generating base moves, grandmasters generating more base moves per minute than experts. In the Swiss sample, comparisons were made from masters to class B players, a range of four standard deviations. There was a clear difference in the quality of move uh, chosen and the duration in the first phase, but no statistical significant difference in the time to reach a decision, though the pattern of means indicates that masters were faster and the rate of generating base moves, no indication of skill effect in the pattern base. There was, however, an effect of skill in several other variables, a number of base moves generated, mean depth of search, mean number of maximal number of intermediate investigations, maximal number of 90 minute reinvestigations. Altogether, the present experiment seemed to indicate that in general, strong and weak players differ along more variables than was found by DeGroote, even though the absolute differences are small. We turn attention now to the absolute value of variables. Each sample was first analyzed by pooling the res results across uh, skill levels. So there's more method. So results presented here indicate that chess players from the Swiss sample differ along more variables than DeGroote's subjects with the qualification that the difference lays mainly between masters and class players and that the average values obtained by the Swiss sample do not diverge significantly from those of the DeGroote sample. The goal of this paper was to replicate a subset of DeGroote's results. This obviously had the disadvantage that the conclusions are limited by the particularities of the position used. In addition, this study does not address other interesting aspects of problem solving in chess, such as the role of familiarity with the position, or whether some positions invite players to search more than other positions. These questions are left for further research. The impact of the results on pattern recognition search models. The replication was in part motivated by the different theoretical accounts given by search and pattern recognition models of chess skill. What is the impact of empirical results on this theoretical discussion? Both recognition Pattern recognition search models predict that strong players choose better moves, they select moves faster, and that they generate more modes in one minute. The first prediction was met, but the second and third were supported only weakly. Such uh, search models predict that strong players search more nodes and search deeper. The first prediction was met, but the second was with the qualification that the difference lies in the average depth of search, not in the maximal depth of search. Uh, finally, pattern recognition models predict that strong players mention very few base moves reinvestigate more often the same move, jump less often between different moves, and have shorter first phase, all these predictions were met. What do the models have to say about the large inter-individual variability of the results found in both samples? This variability is compatible with the pattern recognition model, which proposes that players acquire patterns for the type of openings and position they spend time studying and practicing, and therefore build up various styles of play. Search models are not specific enough about this question, but could account for the variability in data by assuming that players develop different search algorithms. Holding argued that differences in the development of search are incompatible with models based on pattern recognition. This is obviously wrong as pattern recognition should facilitate the generation of moves in the mind's eye permitting a smooth search. Even from the pattern recognition chunking model standpoint, it remains somewhat of a surprise that differences in search are so small between players several standard deviations apart in the ELO scale. First, in comparison with move generation methods relying on processing features of the position from scratch, generation of moves through plot pattern recognition should allow more nodes to be visited in the search space as less time and cognitive resources are spent in generating moves. Second, strong players probably associate sequences of moves to pattern of pieces, which should make it easier for them to carry out deep search. Data from Saruma offers strong evidence for this hypothesis and position where one side could mate by playing either of two sequences of moves. Masters usually chose the suboptimal but familiar sequence of moves. In the case of position A used in the experiment, a possible explanation for the rather shallow shirt sold by subjects in this position is too easy for masters. Actually, the judgment that white has a decisive advantage in the position could be reached without searching more than nine plies deep in all variations, assuming enough knowledge to correctly evaluate the final position. This suggests that pattern recognition, which allows better evaluation of positions, in turn allows cutting down the need for deep search. For expert player, then the critical question is not 
how to search as deep as possible, but when to stop searching. The Class A player who performed the deepest search in the Swiss Tournament 23 plies is a case in point. He did not know when to stop, perhaps because he was not able to evaluate properly the position he was generating. Only when he had reached a very simple end game could he judge the situation correctly. Pattern recognition then not only allows a speedy generation of moves, but also provides a position evaluations that enable the search to be terminated at appropriate times. This dual role of pattern recognition may explain why masters do not perform tree searches of different orders of magnitude than weaker players. I will elaborate this dual role below when discussing the template theory. While Swiss masters did produce higher means of depth of search than other subjects, they were not conspicuous for the maximal depth of search. It could be that for skilled chess players, it's more important to regularly see slightly more than their opponent than to sometimes search at extraordinary depths. This permits in the long range avoiding more errors and seeing more opportunities than the opponent. Simon has developed a formal model to investigate errors in chess. It could be worthwhile to expand his model by connecting his concept of error to the concept of mean depth search, perhaps by assuming that the probability of making an error in playing a move and the mean depth of search are inversely related. Integrating pattern recognition search the template theory. Altogether, the data of this paper vindicate most predictions of the pattern recognition model, but also indicate that there is a difference in the mean depth of search in addition to the results presented here. Other studies mentioned earlier point to the uh, search differences between skill level. This convergent set of evidence calls for a reconciliation of the search and pattern recognition accounts of skill, chess skill, in particular, is necessary to better connect empirical data supporting the role of search with data showing the importance of pattern recognition in memory and perception tasks, and to develop a computational model accounting simultaneous for both sets of data. Thus, contrary to holding claims, the correct approach to chess skill and other skills is not to focus on a single component such as search or pattern recognition, but to understand how these two processes interact. Although the template theory of modification of the Chase and Simon theory proposed by Gobin and Simon was mainly developed to account for empirical data for memory search, Research, it also offers a theoretical background for studying pattern recognition and search processes as well. Templates are chunks of slots that can be rapidly filled with new information. Slots may store values for the location of individual pieces or groups of pieces. In addition, templates give access to other types of information, such as potentially good moves or plans, evaluation of the position. Finally, templates may be connected to other templates. For example, a template describing a position reaching the pan of attack on the Carol Khan defense after 20 moves may be connected to a template describing some type of endgame that occurs often from this type of position. Such connections may also act as macro operators and allow search through a more abstract space than move space. In developing templates through practice and study, and the theory postulates that it takes years to grow several thousand such templates, masters acquire knowledge which affects search in two opposing ways. On the one hand, mechanic mechanisms are developed that make searching easier. For example, practice may allow the association of not only moves, but also sequences of moves to patterns of pieces. Chunking of moves also allow more selective search. A set of candidates is proposed by some patterns of pieces, as well as a deeper search. Time not spent generating moves by other means may be spent searching deeper, and several plies may be readily played in the mind's eye without much conscious search when a chunk of moves is available. In addition, the development of templates may also facilitate search because changing the internal representations of a position when looking forward is made easier by the presence of slots. On the other hand, templates give access to evaluation knowledge, as was shown with Berliner, allows the amount of search to be reduced if the evaluation of position is readily at hand, there's no need for searching deeper. The non monotical behavior of search across skill levels then follows similar uh, from the template theory, assuming that players are faster to develop both the piece slots and the associate pattern to move and fill in the evaluation slots, perhaps because it's easier to associate concrete bits of information than to learn complex and relatively uncertain evaluations of positions. In the first phase, aspiring masters learn many pattern to move associations and piece slots, allowing them to search faster and deeper than they associate more evaluation judgments to the templates and therefore diminish the need for search. This could account for Salomon's results that his grandmasters and international masters search less than his experts, as well as for DeGroote's results when his grandmasters search less than his masters. The Swiss sample offered a different pattern where masters were searching deeper than the subjects of the other groups. This could be done due to the fact that Swiss masters did not reach a high enough level of expertise. They were clearly weaker than both Sodermund's and DeGroote's strongest players. In conclusion, the template theory offers a promising avenue to tie together the concepts of search and pattern recognition, which have not been yet integrated into a single theory of chess skill. As Kodinger and Anderson correctly note, no chess program has yet been written that both simulates 
um, recall experiments and plays chess, let alone plays at master level. The Crest model, which implements the template theory as a computer program, simulates several critical results from literature on chess perception and memory, including results that were considered highly detrimental to the original chunking theory. It also, also offers a framework allowing theories of chess memory and perception, as well as theories of problem solving to be integrated in unified computational model. Research in cognitive psychology has shown that many aspects of expertise are specific from domain to domain. However, it has also shown that there exist a few invariants in human cognition, such as the limit size of short-term memory, uh, perhaps four chunks, and the time to encode a new chunk in long-term memory, about eight seconds. The research reported here converges with previous work to indicate that there are also existing strong limits on the time needed to process a state in the problem space, perhaps eight problem states in one minute. In the future, as in the past, empirical research using chess will help us pinpoint these cognitive invariants. Okay. Hi, T. Thanks for sticking around. So uh, here you have some of the most classic papers in uh, chess psychology. So you know, I read some of those overviews, and you know, here we've completed almost you know, bringing up to present. So let, let's quickly go through this one last paper. And then uh, you know we'll see what we'll do a after that. But uh, here is uh, um, expertise in complex decision making: the role of search in chess, seventy years after De Groot, and this is already to uh, two thousand eleven. So you know De Groot is writing in nineteen forty four, and uh, the advances in chunking theory, Chase and Simon in seventy three, and then Gobit, uh, you know the eighties and nineties. So you know, this paper is looking: what's the state of the research? in um, 2011. One of the most influential studies in all expertise research is DeGroote's 1946 study of chess players, which suggested that pattern recognition rather than search was the key detriment determinant of expertise. Many changes have occurred in the chess world since DeGroote's study, leading some authors to argue that cognitive mechanisms underlying expertise have also changed. We decided to replicate DeGroote's study to empirically test these claims and to examine whether the trends in the data have changed over time. Six grandmasters, five international masters, six experts, and five class A experts competed in the think aloud procedure for two chess positions. Findings indicate that grandmasters and international masters search more quickly than experts and class A players, and that both groups today search subsequently substantially faster than players in previous studies. These findings, however, support the group's overall conclusions that are consistent with predictions uh, made by pattern recognition models. Across many different domains, experts make difficult and complex decisions under conditions of uncertainty and time pressure. These experts can be viewed as having either superior analytical skills in generating value alternatives or greater ability to recognize situational characteristics and promising options based on stored knowledge. Although both of these elements are undoubtedly essential, current theories emphasize the role of pattern recognition and expert decision making. One of the most important sources of evidence is the view of DeGroote's study of expert chess players. This study is one of the most influential and frequently cited expertise research and indeed the entire psychological literature. Reported that DeGroote's work is in the 99.9 .9 percentile in terms of frequency of citation. DeGroote presents chess players of varying skill, including some of the best players of the time, with an unfamiliar position and ask them to think aloud as they analyze the position of, and choose what move they would like to make. DeGroote found that contrary to popular belief, the strongest players did not think further ahead than weaker players. World-class grandmasters searched at a similar depth and considered a similar number of options as mere chess experts. The GMs nevertheless made better decisions than the experts, choosing better moves and examining moves more relevant to their position. In a second test, the chess players were shown a chess position for a brief period of time and tested on their recall. GMs proven to have a much greater recall of chess positions than the chess experts. Subsequent research uh, Chase and Simon, 73, revealed that more skillful players displayed this much superior recall only when positions were meaningful and typically of ordinary play, but not when pieces were randomly arranged on the board. These findings suggest that what accounted for skills and differences, at least above a certain level of proficiency, was recognizing patterns based on previous experience rather than a real-time search through various options or a difference in general capacity. This work inspired a number of studies which found evidence that pattern recognition underlies many other domains of expertise. Various theories of expertise have been proposed to account for these findings. Arguably the most influential of these are chunking and template theories, which hold that expertise is made possible by the ability to recognize patterns in the task environments on the basis of past experiments. In chess, experts recognize perceptual chunks 
typical and distinctive configurations of pieces that they have acquired through practice and study and stored in long-term memory. When an expert recognizes a chunk, it prompts them to think of a move or strategy based on previous experience and so allows them to make a superior decision. A contrary view, however, was taken by Holding, who denied the importance of pattern recognition and said emphasized the role of search. Holding proposed that masters play better than novice because they search more deeply and quickly than novices and also better evaluate the products of their search using their general knowledge. In many ways, however, the contrast between Pattern recognition search models is a false opposition as both elements are clearly important. Nevertheless, the relative contribution of search and pattern recognition of the expertise has remained a contentious issue in the literature. Many changes have occurred in chess since the group conducted its study in the 1930s and 40s, such as an increased access to database, shorter time limits in tournaments, and the destruction of chess computers and online plays. These changes have led um, some to argue that the cognitive underpinnings of expertise have also changed. Um, Van Harveld suggests that in the 30s and 40s, chess players tended to rely on pattern recognition and general rules of thumb, such as the importance of controlling the center of the board. Van Harveld claimed that these principles are now outdated and that search is much more important. Modern chess on a high level no longer relies on rule-oriented or principle-oriented thinking, fast processes, but focus on concrete analysis of the position at hand, slow processes. In effect, then, Van Harveld suggests that the group's seminal results were an artifact of the cultural and historical context in which the study was set. Given the importance of Groot's finding, Van Harveld suggests in to reserve empirical examination. Unfortunately, however, there is a comparatively little recent empirical data on chess players thinking to test Van Harveld's uh, claim. In spite of the large impact that Groot's study has had on cognitive psychology, there's only been one direct replication of Groot's study conducted by Gobit. This study was limited in that it did not include any GMs, which makes it difficult to compare players at the highest levels of skill, and that it only used one position. In addition, Goba collected his data in 1986, and many of the changes in chess occurred since then. Even though each domain of expertise may have its idiosyncratic properties, it is important to understand the role of search in chess because the chess research has been a cornerstone of the argument that practice and pattern recognition are the keys to expertise. The present study thus sought to replicate the group study using his think aloud method. This procedure has since acquired strong empirical support for its val validity. Masters, uh, GMs, and IMs, and intermediate players were asked to analyze two chess positions and the search characteristics of the two groups were compared. In addition, analysis compared the search characteristics of players in the study of Lowe's and degrees in the Degobit study. The memory experiments that the group conducted were not repeated because they have recently been replicated many times. Okay, so you see, uh, you know, look at these, the, the famous positions. Um, you maybe at a different time, I'll actually like get a board and play over some of these, but today, um, no, just thought processes, not the actual chess. So we see here you know, the, the um, quality of move chosen, total time to choose a move, number of node search, rate of generating nodes per minute, number of base moves, uh, number of episodes, maximal depth, mean depths. Um, and you see the results here of uh, masters and immediate of the different position, the quality of move, um, intermediates, encourage people more interested in chess to look at these differences and complicate and uh, consider what they mean. An additional analysis comparing these absolute values of search characteristics across the studies um, in skill, masters versus intermediate, and uh, between subjects, we refer to this as the historical trend analysis. This analysis is used in NOVA to compare across studies based on Gobitz who used the statistical procedure to compare his results to the groups. This approach is justified because all three studies use the same procedure and stimuli for the analysis that the principal participants in the Groots and Gobert studies were categorized in as either masters or intermediates. These categories allow easy comparisons across studies and maximize the statistical power of the analysis. The historical trend analysis is used in position A because the Groot only report raw data for this position and Gobert only use this position in the studies. So means and standard deviations. So you see the quality of the move from 1946 to 1988 to the current study. So actually the quality of the masters decrease and intermediate increases. Um, in terms of skill level, there are four significant differences between master and intermediate players and search value across the three studies. First, masters chose better quality moves than intermediate players. 
Second, masters search faster, generating more nodes per minute than intermediate players. Third, masters took less time to decide the moves than intermediate players. Finally, masters showed a deeper mean depth of search than intermediates. This depth effect, however, was due to the presence of class B players in Globus data, a group less skillful than the groups in the current study. Renounced the data without this group, removed this effect, but did not alter the effects found in the quality move speed or time. There was no statistical significant difference between masters and intermediate players in terms of the number of nodes searched. Comparing across the studies, there were four significant differences, including the total number of nodes searched, number of nodes generated per minute, number of episodes, and the number of base moves. Given the size of the effects, it is important to emphasize that these variables were measured in the same way across the three studies. For the first three variables, post hoc analysis showed significant contrast between the current study and both De Groot and Gobit study. Players in the current study search more nodes, search more quickly, and search more episodes than players in the previous two studies. For the number of base moves, however, post hoc analysis showed no significant difference between the current study and De Groot's, but significant difference between the current study and Gobit's. There were no other differences between studies. So given the importance of De Groot's findings to theory's expert decision making, this study sought to replicate De Groot's study. Our analysis showed that skilled players differ from less skilled players in their search in more ways than previously thought. Masters search faster and possibly also more deeply than intermediates. However, these mean differences existed in De Groot's sample as well, though they were not reported. This indicates that there has not been an underlying change in the relative roles of search and pattern recognition in chess expertise, although it also suggests that statistical power was an issue in the previous studies. Overall, the findings support the robustness of both DeGroote's conclusion and pattern recognition models. The findings thus suggest that the pattern recognition remains critical to chess skill despite other evidence that chess has changed. Particularly, the historical trend analysis shows large differences in the absolute values of speed and search and the amount of search across studies. These differences provide some support to Van Harvefeld's claim that chess has changed. Relative differences between master and intermediates. Both the current study analysis and the historical trend analysis revealed that mo masters generate more nodes per minute than intermediate players. This indicates that while masters may search more quickly than intermediates, this difference has remained constant over time. The previous study conducted by De Groot and Gobit showed the trend of more skillful players to search more quickly than less skillful players, but the differences did not reach statistical significance. This suggests that the power may have been an issue in these studies. Importantly, both search and pattern recognition models predict that strong players generate moves faster during search than weaker players, so that current findings are consistent with both models. With respect to depth of search, however, there was no clear differences between masters and intermediate in terms of maximal depth of search. Both the current study analysis and historical trend analysis showed that there was a trend for masters to search more deeply than intermediate players, though this did not reach statistical significance for mean depth of search. No differences in skill levels found in the current sample, nor in the historical trend analysis once class B players in Gobit sample, a group weaker than the groups in the current sample were removed. The fact that the differences in search depth between masters and intermediary players, players several standard deviations apart in the ELO rating skill were not statistically significant and the effect sizes were small suggest that other factors such as pattern recognitions continue to play a more important role than search depth and chess expertise. Expertise, indeed, pattern recognition models predict that more skillful players have a greater number of chunks and templates than less skillful players, and this will turn promote a deeper, more efficient search. The weak indication of relationship between skill and depth of search, rather than the strong, almost linear relationship proposed between search models, seems consistent with the pattern recognition account. Finally, results showed no differences between masters and intermediates in terms of the number of nodes search, number of episodes, and the number of base moves. This indicates that the amount of breadth of search is not sufficient for expert performance and that, again, other factors such as evaluation made possible by pattern recognition play an important role. Importantly, however, the analysis that found marginal or no effects all suffered from chronically low power, even when large sample size of the historical trend analysis so is possible with that the other differences in search between master and intermediates um, exist but were not detected. Even if this were the case, the effects would appear less strong than other kinds of differences that have been reported in literature, such as the memory of patterns of Chase and Simon 73. Overall, then, our analysis show evidence that masters search more quickly and possibly also more deeply than intermediates, even if the two groups do not differ on other measures of search. This shows that the two skill groups differ more ways than originally reported, although the overall trend of the data remains the same. These findings are thus somewhat analogous to the results from 
the memory recall experiments of random positions, which have likewise shown that masters perform slightly better on this task than weaker players, contrary to the original report that there was no difference in skill when recalling random positions. Nevertheless, the difference in search we found seemed relatively minor compared to the large differences between masters and immunity as shown in the memory recall experiments for meaningful patterns. The results thus support the group's overall conclusion and are entirely consistent with predictions made by pattern recognition models. The findings add to a large body of research from other domains of expertise supporting this view. Changes in the absolute value of speed and number of nodes search. Results showed that the absolute value for speed in search and the number of nodes search were much higher than previous studies, irrespective of skill level. These two measures are related. As a result, the greater speed players generate more nodes in their overall search. The present study found that players are capable of searching more than 10 nodes per minute. This is faster than the group and others thought, but is consistent with values reported um, by uh, GOBA 2004. These findings are also consistent with GOBA's 1997 search model, a form of model of template theory which predicts the very similar values for speed of search to what were found in the study. This provides further support of pattern recognition accounts. Nevertheless, these differences across studies require explanation. It is unlikely that methodological differences could account for these differences. As the group hand recorded its protocols, it is possible that he may have underestimated some values. Gobit over tape recorded its protocols and reported very similar values to the group. So the difference between studies cannot simply be attributed to technological differences. Variability in coding also cannot explain these differences because the same criteria for coding were used and these criteria are very strictly defined. Indeed, both search speed and number of nodes search are measured in terms of the total number of moves a player mentions, as well as the amount of time taken in the case of speed. And neither of these base measures is subject to the interpretation of a coder. Finally, previous studies did not use a warm up task for the verbal protocol, so it is possible that part of the difference might be attributed to this. However, it seems unlikely this could explain roughly threefold increase in the number of nodes visited, especially given the players spend an average more than 10 minutes considering the position in all studies, whereas in the warm-up exercise only took a couple of minutes. So presumably, even if they spent the first couple of minutes warming up in previous studies, they were equivalent to the current study after that. Instead, the data suggests that some aspects of thinking in chess have changed in the 20 years since Gopa conducted his study. Several major changes have occurred in chess during this period. They include, for example, the introduction of shorter time limits and the abolition of adjournments and tournament which both suit players capable of thinking quickly. For example, in 1986, the World Championship map required players to make their first 40 moves in 150 minutes. However, 2004 um, was 40 moves in 90 minutes. Other changes in this period include the popularization of chess computers and chess base, a computer database of opponents' game, which together assist players to prepare for games and encourage quicker decision-making. As a result of these changes, it's possible that tournament chess today might select for players capable of thinking quickly. If this is the case, then it shows the robustness and the importance of pattern recognition in expert decision making, which seems to have remained constant over time. On balance, therefore, the results of the study support the group's original conclusion. Although masters may differ from intermediaries in the search in more ways than previously thought, the results fit within the broader trend of research emphasizing the importance of pattern recognition and expert performance. The factors underpinning expert decision making, however, continue to be an important area of research and is likely that studies involving chess will continue to inform the field. Okay, Jim, thanks for showing up. Um, okay, so this is going pretty good. So let's uh, even uh, do more than I had expected. Okay, so I want to look at um, related to this. Let's look at how computers process chess. So I got two slideshows here. Found this from Carlos Justinano. Look at how computers play chess. Brief history of chess. Core modules will make up make up chess programs. So I'm not going to look at the history. You know, so there's more books have been written about chess than for all other games combined. Chess is fascinating. Intellectual game, kings, queens, bodies, the struggle of common men to entire kingdoms, an epic battle of life and death. Chess today, uh, estimated 700 million people play chess. Computers surpass the best human. Competitive chess players use computers in order to prepare for human opponents. So it took a period of time 
early inventor Al Jazari described many such inventions in the book, The Book of Knowledge of Ingenious Mechanical Devices, with 1206. Um, you have the famous Turk, which is uh, almost certainly was a fake, where someone, uh, it was supposedly a mechanical chess playing machine, but uh, really they think there was a dude who was inside of it. 1930s, the creation of electromagnetic computers began. The late 40s, computers were used to research and military tools. ENIAC, there you see Jennings. Um, 1945, Conrad Zeus, the German pioneer of computer science, first wrote about the possibility of creating a game of chess. Although previous, uh, as I uh, saw so in Wolfram's uh, books, that uh, previous thinkers before even computers existed had already thought about the theory of programming chess like Turing. Conrad developed one of the first electronic computers, the Zeus One. There's no record of him actually creating a chess program. 49, Claude Shannon authored a seminal paper entitled Programming a Computer for Playing Chess. Many of Shannon's ideas are still in use today. 51, British mathematician, early computer program Turing, wrote about chess computer. Uh, he later completed a one-move chess analyzer called TuroChamp. Turing's chess analyzer didn't run an actual computer, but it was rather a set of instructions he could execute by hand. Turing simply calculated chess moves by looking ahead one move at a time and scoring them. Although played on paper, this was the first program to play a complete game of chess. Turing believed the game such as chess served an ideal model in which to study machine intelligence. So 50s through the 80s, chess programs using a 6x6 six six board in 1957 instead of the 8x8 eight eight board. 57, the first program to play a game of chess developed by Alex Bernstein. Um, in the U.S. and in, in one by programs in Russia. 1961, a Russian chess computer played a game against a human chess amateur. This was the first recorded game of man versus machine, although the machine lost. It wouldn't be long before the tables would turn. Along with advances in the mainframe and many computers, chess programs also continued to improve in the 60s and 70s. During the 70s and 80s, Joe Condon and Kem Tonsis of Bell Labs created Bell, the first chess machine to reach master strength play. Side note, you may remember Ken Thompson is the creator of the Unix operating system. In the 80s also ushered in low-cost uh, chess computers. 80s and 90s, during the 80s, we also started seeing chess programs for the early personal computers as well as dedicated chess machines for consumers. 90s were an exciting time for chess computers, chess history, as chess programs began challenging international chess masters and later grandmasters. This progress was fueled by faster chess computers improvements in software and advances in computer science. IBM's Deep Blue, 1997, um, beat world champion Gary Kasparov by two wins against one and three draws. First time in human history, a machine defeated world champion. Early 2000, Deep Blue was a highly specialized machine designed to play chess. However, PCs were also getting better. The early 2000s, there were three high-profile matches between world-class Chess players and PCs. 2002, Vladimir Kramlik and Deep Fritz completed an eight game match, the ending in a draw. 2003, Gary Kasparov played Junior, ending in a draw. Uh, later that year, Kasparov played X3D Junior in the match, also ending in a draw. Keep in mind that these games were played against gamer class PCs and not large mini and supercomputers, not bad for machines less powerful than Deep Blue. 2005, Human Chess Dominance Ends. 2005 Hydra, specialized chess machine using 34, 64 processors, defeated the sixth ranked player in the world, Michael Adams, five and a half to half in a six game match. 2006 undisputed world champion Vladimir Kramnik played Deep Fritz and lost by a score of two to four. Today, chess programs running on our mobile phones play better than all but the world's top human players. Today, all competitive chess players train using machines. Most have no chance of winning against the machines in actual tournament play. What about speed? 1980s, a microcomputer could ex execute just over 2 million instructions per second. By the 90s, it was over 50 million. Um, today, processors in our tablets and phone are capable of executing over a billion instructions per second. Advances in computer science and software tools have also helped considerably, but advances in raw processing speed can't be ignored. So thinking games, process of thinking about how to win involves employing strategies to which bring about closer to achieving the solution all games have strategies and um, for computer programs these strategies are described using heuristics and algorithms so heuristics and algorithms computer science the term heuristics refers to a method of solving a problem by getting closer to a solution or end goal in contrast the term algorithm refers to a method of solving a particular problem it's common for heuristics to involve one or more algorithms 
most non-trivial games can't be realistically solved with an algorithm, largely because it would take too long. Uh, solving chess, uh, you know, just the sheer number of uh, possibilities, say 10 to the 20th, it would just uh, take forever. Um, brute force would be impossible to solve chess. Look at all um, possibilities. So chess computers that can't exhaustively look out the variations to the end have evaluating choices. So if choices have to be evaluated, then we need a way of performing the evaluation. In the field of intelligent games, this is referred to evaluation function um, in part of relation to the truth, multiple truth hypothesis. This evaluation function in chess is a form of truth function. The function says, given a known move, return a score. The best move in a list of choices is the move which scored the highest. So machine sees before a chess program can evaluate a move, we must first teach it to represent a chess position. This is unsurprisingly known as board representation. You know, it could just be a list of squares, like 1 to 64. The pieces could have values. There's different ways of doing it. Um, so from the people more in computer programming, you do, do you start like a 6 by 6 grid? Do you have numerical values? And the grid is actually bigger than the 8 by 8. Um, how do you go about you're recognizing a move or the strength of pieces? Could you do it by number? If it's a numbered square and a piece moves from one square to another, that that's simply a, a numerical value. So all these things of how you um, create numerical algorithms for chess, um, you know, for the more program centric. So chess programs proceeds to encode the offset differences for each piece. The algorithm is known as a legal move generator. With a list of legal moves, the program can then run the evaluation function against each resulting move to begin to isolate a best move. In the chess evaluation function would essentially weigh various desirable characteristics in a chess position to return a score. This is one of the earliest method, methods used in computer chess. Simple evaluation function would ask questions like, how many moves do I have available? Is my king safe? Evaluating functions are typically implemented using a weighted sum model. This approach assigns relative values to various chess factors to arrive at a weighted score. Before we can assign values in a weighted sum function, we have to argue, agree on a basic unit of measurement. You know, so for example, the value of pieces, like here times 100, the 13, 3.559 model. Each factor of an evaluation function is assigned a value relative to a centi pawn, that is a hundredth of a pawn. For a desired factor, the chess program asks how much of a pawn is that factor worth. Evaluation functions also contain a measure of material balance, that is by a show of remaining pieces. Who is winning? This is determined by adding up the value of each side's pieces, which are already measured in centi pawns, so a knight and two pawns are equal to 500 or equal to a value of a rook. Here's another example. A chess game begins with each side having two bishops. It's considered advantageous to retain both bishops for as long as possible. So an evaluation function might value the presence of both bishops as equal to half a centi pawn or 50. Once a player no longer has both bishops, an evaluation function would cease to add the 50 to its overall score. Many factors go into evaluation functions, such as king safety and piece mobility. A greater mobility often equates to more options and opportunities. The presence or absence of various factors is what determines how a position is scored. So below evaluation function um, you know, example, simpler evaluation functions will model how beginners see chess positions, while more complex evaluation functions model how very strong players see position. Complex evaluation functions take more time to execute than simple ones. Thus, other algorithms need to be employed to speed up the selection process. Searching for the best move. So now that we've seen how a chess set position can be represented and how it is it can be evaluated, we're ready to consider how good moves can be found. In order for a chess program to decide a best move, it must also take into account its opponent's move, followed by its own replies and so on. This is known as looking ahead. Good chess players look ahead a few moves, while great chess players have been known to look ahead a dozen or so moves. Keep a track of evaluations. We've seen how computers represent chess positions. You notice how we contradict the group. He probably didn't read the group. We've seen how many computers represent chess positions and how they evaluate them, but how do they keep track of what they've evaluated? Game trees, tool to graph positions, nodes, and moves, and their relative evaluations. It's like we saw in Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster. When inverted, a game tree appears more like a natural tree with a trunk, branches, and leaves 
moving upward. So in computer science, a tree is also known as a data structure. Common data structures include arrays and hash tables, also known as dictionary or associative arrays. Trees can be implemented as arrays of nodes, where each node contains both a pointer to its parent and an array with sibling nodes. Example, the opening moves and the various possibilities that they open to and the exponential nature of increasing. So game trees, like other data structures, are useful for more than just short storing data. Algorithms typically operate on data structures. For example, a sorted array may contain a list of places and an algorithm might be used to find specific locations. So game trees and search algorithms. A game tree is built using a legal move generator and nodes are evaluated using evaluation function, which is described earlier. Search algorithms navigate the game tree while looking at the score left by an evaluation function. As a search algorithm visits a node, it may be further update other node values along the way. Over the years, many search algorithms have been devised. The minimax algorithm was the first search method used in computer chess, max values, a positive are assigned to moves for the first player, while min values are assigned to moves for the second player. The game tree is filled with min and max values and ordered so that any given node contains the min value or max value of the best replies below it in the way a path to the best highest scoring move is identified. Alpha beta pruning is a search algorithm which improves upon the min max algorithm by reducing the number of nodes which need to be evaluated. It does this by discarding a move branch when it's proven to be worse than the one already in identified. We humans do this when we consider a choice, which is so bad that we stop considering and move on to the more promising options. Alpha beta pruning on a minimax tree, you see you know, eight, five, nine, these ones were determined that they did not need to be analyzed. So improved alpha beta over the years, many improvements have been made to alpha beta pruning algorithms. So key components uh, looked at here, board representation, game state, how to represent a given position, move generation, given a position, determine all the legal moves, static evaluation, how to assess a given position based on various factors, search how to locate the best moves in a game tree of chess positions. Theories we covered should give you a sense of how computers play chess. Naturally, this talk is gross oversimplification, but with additional research into the ideas we've covered, most talented programmers should be able to build their own chess program. Okay, so did I put that one in the chat? Okay, so here's one more on computers, and I'll finish up with the uh, uh, this famous psychology on chess. In Kush, yep, the Dutch masters. Um, I've been reading a lot from the Dutch today, the Dutch and the Swiss. So a, lot of, a lot of research comes from them. Okay, so Alpha Zero, how a modern AI is reshaping thought. This is from Keisha Vishwananda from UC Berkeley in 2018. Brief history of computer chess, 1997. IBM's Deep Blue defeats the uh, World champion Kasparov after several attempts, early 2000 chess engines commercially available, late 2000 chess engines have become consistently stronger than grandmasters. You can see uh, um, Stockfish, uh, you know, Magnus Carlsen's in the 2800s, and here you have uh, um, you know, multiple computers that are hundreds of points higher. Um, December 2007, Alpha Zero developed by DeepMind, crushed leading chess engine Stockfish with 28 wins, and 72 draws from 100 games, didn't lose a single game. Stockfish works. Previous chess engines relied on alpha beta pruning and heuristic evaluation, like uh, we showed in the previous one. Parameters of heuristic evaluation adjusted by hand and trial and error. Alpha Zero uses a Monte Carlo tree search. And I've talked about Monte Carlo, and we can review and other things, very important concept, people familiar like a randomization method, people you know, uh, like Monte Carlo, like the casino game, simulates games and determines probability of winning with a certain move, fundamentally different approaches to chess AI. Neural network used to learn game, picks better and better moves by updating probability vector with each iteration of the Monte Carlo simulation, self-reinforcement learning. So the advantage of the, of the Alpha Zero algorithm doesn't require hardcore opening books or end game table bases, unlike Stockfish. Extremely efficient, only analyzes 80,000 positions per second compared to 70 million for a Stockfish. 
scalable to other complete information two-player games. AlphaZero um, neural network computations done on tensor processing unit not commercially available. AlphaZero is not feasible for ordinary computers. Uh, you know, some reaction, Cariano was amazed. Cariakin would pay over $100,000, probably have to pay a lot more. Wesley So, chess isn't yet dead. It's pretty inexhaustible. The main problem is that most of the games are the same for the first 12, 15 moves. So the future of AI, uh, moving away from blind search, neural networks very close parallel to how humans learn chess, ever-increasing conceptual power. And, you know, this concept of neural networks and uh, the most recent thoughts on AI and neural networks and the most recent developments on understanding the hard problem of consciousness is largely copying how neural networks produce machine learning and then seeing if that could map out to the brain. So Alpha Zero, revolutionary for both chess and AI, a result of big changes we have already begun to see with machine learning and neural networks more closely simulating human thought could have a great impact in the future. Next step could be applying this to incomplete information games like poker. Okay, great. So uh, um, put that link in the chat also. People um, I'll look at that. I guess I already had that in the chat. Okay, so yes, Sojourn's still here. And uh, so here is the last document I'll be looking at today. We'll see how much I'll look at it. This is a whole book like... Uh, um, think like a grandmaster chess classic, um, psychology and class chess by Nikolai Krogius. You'd see it's uh, got an approbation by uh, Boris Spassky. So look at the contents here. We're going to look at it's the psychology of chess. Um, you look at some of the opinions from the Famous players, the world champions, the chess in image. What is the chess image? Retained image, inert image, and forward image. Hope to um, read a little bit about that. Uh, intuition. And then the question of attention. What is attention? Factors affecting attention on familiar conditions at a competition. Controlling one's emotions um, versus deficiencies in attention. There's time trouble um, and other things in the book. Um, you know, I would encourage people interested to read the whole book. It's a great book. Um, but, uh, you know, I've already been at this uh, almost three hours. So I'm just going to read a little of the highlights here. So, uh, psychologist on chess. The chess player expects that psychology will help him in revealing the intellectual qualities needed for more successful play and by demonstrating how to control the formation and development of these qualities. Psychological investigations will also define rather more personal problems, and so if we analyze the peculiarities of a competitor's play, we can determine the most sustainable training methods for that player. We can help him study effective methods of calculation, and we can help him overcome problems such as recurrent time trouble. In this way, psychological research may and should be utilized to improve players' performance by developing and maintaining his supporting abilities. That is not all, not only a psychology of use to the chess player, but chess itself has considerable interest for general psychology. Chess has recently come to the attention of students in cybernetics. Mathematicians and scientists are also interested in the role that the game plays in forming a man's character, its beneficial effect on his mind, its determination in his senses. They view chess as a convenient model for investigation of man's creative process and learning the secrets of chess history. They see the way to understand the riddles of man's creative activity. However, at the moment, the success of science in creating computer programs that play chess is rather limited. The reason being that they, that until recently, the programs have ignored the specifically human aspects of chess. So this is an old book. The differences between human players thinking and the thinking of the machine are well illustrated in the works of Soviet psychologists um, who noticed that many of the computer programs that search for a move proceeds by way of reducing the number of variations to be examined. Man thinks differently. Initially, he too rejects the unsatisfactory variations, but of his intended move does not satisfy him. He immediately widens the scope of his search and analyzes new possibilities. The need for a different approach to the problem of perfect uh, machine play was indicated by the Akademian uh, Glushkovs in order to master the programming of the most complicated problems, the sphere of man's intellectual labor, there is perhaps no 
other way but to investigate the process of human reasoning. Work has already been undertaken in that direction. For example, there was a match between Soviet and American computer program in 1967. And there are also the interesting proposed advance by Botvinnik in his book, Computers, Chess, and Long Range Planning. In connection with the intense of research being done in programming, the question arises, will chess cease to exist once computers have learned how to play? Well, if one is speaking theoretically, it must be admitted that electronic super grandmaster can be created since chess is a system of finite information. Even if this finite information is very great, however, we should not work on this supposition that there will be an electronic champion. We should turn to the actual living ones. This is all the more advisable since material already collected in the field of chess psychology interests both chess players and computer scientists. First investigation of this field was made by French psychologist uh, Alfred Binet in the date of 1894. Binet was studying blindfold chess and collected some very interesting data from which he drew the correct conclusion that visual images of chess players bear a mainly conceptual character. Thus, for instance, some masters players were unable to answer offhanded questions about the color of a particular square on the board. However, Binet himself was apparently not too well up on the finer points of chess, and he believed the assertion of one of his subjects that he could calculate 500 moves ahead. In 1925, the competitors in the Moscow International Tournament were subject to psychological investigation. In a book was wrote about the experiment. Lasker, Reddy, Tarktower, and Tory were amongst those who submitted to the experiments. The chess players who were being compared with non-chess playing subjects were found to have highly developed dynamic qualities of concentration and reasoning, as well as having a specific chess memory. The authors proposed a so-called psychograph of chess players, 16 qualities, which in their opinion determined success in play. Many of their recommendations are indisputable. For instance, self-control, the ability to integrate one's thoughts and discipline determination. Some of their proposals, however, debatable. They assume, for example, that the development of chess players' reasoning is not directly related to the general level of cultural development, but practice has overwhelmingly demonstrated that this opinion is incorrect and that a high general cultural helps to develop chess playing ability in a remarkable way. Similarly, the author's assertion that they did not discover any real talent common to the greatest players could be attributed to the narrowness of the methods employed in the investigation. The well-known chess master and psychologist Bloomfield also made a significant contribution to the assessment of psychological questions involved in chess thinking. He demonstrated that chess players' thinking is rich in vividness and that is exceptional emotional content and intense determination. Bloomfield noted the practical character of chess thinking and that the thought is directly linked to the action, the time limit, and the tournament play intensifies the thinking process and compels the mind to work in the most economical manner. Bloomfield was the first to suggest a number of interesting methods for the psychological investigation of creativity in chess. For instance, he introduced the practice of noting the time it taken for each move which has now become a very popular method of recording the player's thoughts during the game. Bloomfield also tried to investigate the intuitive forms of chess thinking. In this respect, special attention should be given to his assumptions about the emergence of intuitive conjecture, which depends on the retention and the memory of images of similar positions. In all, Bloomfield made many very practical recommendations. For instance, he advised that if a move is forced, it should be played, and only then should the player make a deep study of the resulting position, not vice versa. He emphasized that calculating one should not rely solely upon visual concepts, and they are less tangible than the direct impression of the position on the board. Thus, it is necessary to check every move, however obvious it may appear in the previous study. In recent years, various works devoted to chess psychology have been published. The American Grandmaster Ruben Fine, in his own book, The Psychology of the Chess Player, examines the creativity of Morphe, Steinitz, Lasker, Casablanca, Elkine, U, Botvinnik, and other great players by applying Freud's analytical concepts to their lives. Fine explains the development of chess skills by the role played by repressed instincts and other assumptions of Freudian psychoanalysis, which are hard to believe. Unfortunately, Fine did not utilize his own rich experience of tournament play in writing this book. Also of interest are the investigation, the potential of young players using chess proposed by sex psychologist Cherney. The subject is asked, say, to move a knight from Queen Rook Run one to every other square on the board as quickly as possible. After the completion of this problem, black pawns are placed on different squares, then the knight is once again moved to every square except those occupied or attacked by the pawns. In these and other tests, a stopwatch is used to record the time taken for the solution of the problem. The number of errors and accuracy of the problems are considered as are the persistence and determination of the subject. Although Charney tests may not provide sufficiently complete and objective material with which to assess the aptitude of the player, they do deserve mention along with other methods. It is interesting to note that experiments conducted by Charney several years ago correctly predicted a great chess future for Hort, yet trainers did not regard him as the most promising player in the groups of guinea pigs. Chess players on psychology and the question of style. Valuable materials provided 
for the psychologist and the views of leading players is expressed in the comments in their own games and articles and books and analyzing the material. We must make allowances for the fact that chess masters generally not professional psychologists and therefore their use of techno terms is not always justified from the scientific point of view. However, furthermore, they are none too keen to relate their experiences and thought Al can complain with justice about this. I think it would have been an interest of millions of chess followers and also the game itself when annotating their games, the masters spoke a little more openly about their motives, impelling them to choose certain moves. On the other hand, when a player recalls the psychological aspects of a game, we can almost certainly count on hearing the true and sincere evidence of an expert. Manuel Lasker was the first to realize that behind the moves of chess pieces, there is concealed a human being with his own character. Lasker understood this it is impossible to learn the secrets of chess contests without the human element, without the player's psychology, his expertise during the class, his idiosyncrasies, and his preference. The Lasker chess was above all a struggle between two personalities, two intellects. He maintained it as two human beings who fight on the chessboard, not the wooden pieces. And he studied the style, the weak and strong points of his opponent's play in detail in order to apply his conclusion to actual play. Often he tried to play moves that were not objectively the best, but which were the most unpleasant ones for a particular opponent. In an interview, Lasker once said, a game of chess is a contest in which a variety of factors apply. Therefore, it is extremely important to know the strength and weakness of the opponent. For instance, uh, Marcosi's, uh, Maroxi's games show that he defends cautiously and only attacks when forced to do so. The games of Janowski show that he may have won a position in his grasp 10 times, but as he is reluctant to finish the game, he is bound to lose it in the end. We can see that much may be obtained from the attentive study of the adversary's games. Lasker skillfully exploited the psychological peculiarities of opponents, forcing upon them a kind of game that was alien to their taste. Lasker was the first to suggest that chess style is the reflection of the personal characteristic, and he demonstrated the validity of this hypothesis in his game. Lasker's method was not fully understood by his contemporaries, many of whom commented on his inexplicable good luck in chess, almost as if he possessed hypnotic powers. In recent years, the concrete psychological approach to the study of one's opponent has received a right or application. It is true that even before Lasker, the French masker uh, Arnaud de, uh, de Rivera asserted that the character and temperament of the player may be determined from his play and that his personality reveals itself in the style of play. However, the casual earmark was not taken up and went unnoticed. Lasker proposed a detailed classification of styles in play indicating the following categories. The classical style, classical style plan is not chosen at random, but intelligently in keeping with the principles of common sense. The style of automation, always making stereotype moves which are stored in memory. Solid style of building up the position and awaiting the opponent's error. The style inviting the opponent to error in the combative style. One can dispute these classifications, for instance, the concept of common sense is rather wide. It means merely the correct evaluation of the position by intuition than the designation of such appraisals to the representation of only one style is hardly correct. Lasker does not use consistent principles to govern his decisions. In some cases, he uses different character traits, such as the tacit tactic of enticing or waiting for the opponent's error, while in other cases, he uses the quality of logical reasoning in spite of all these controversial points, Lasker tends to systematize styles of a player has not lost the significance even today. After all, it was only in 1925 that he first challenged the traditional divisions of style into competitive and positional. Let's consider how far the methods of assessing style have progressed to the present day. Apart from the success of practical application, um, the investigations have not made much progress. It is still often the case that only two styles, combative and positional, are described in chess literature. To the first of these categories, I would assign those players who indulge in sharp tactical play containing sacrifices and combinations. It is held that players exhibiting a combative style possess highly developed powers of creative imagination and the ability to make far reaching concrete calculations. Their imagination, in particular, obvious in the middle game, where the large number of pieces creates a great variety of possible moves. Anderson, Morphy, Tregoran, Alkine, Tal, Larson, Bronstein are all reckoned to fall in this category. Players' positional style are more solid and quieter approach to the game. Their play is characterized by faith in the general principles of strategy and their evaluation of the position is based on logical conclusions. Their creativity relies on a belief that the basic guidelines which modify by any peculiar conditions of the position and concrete calculations play a comparatively minor role in the mental processes. 
is characteristic of positional players that they regard chess as scientific discipline, having definite guiding principles. Steinitz, Kaplanenko, Rubenstein, Botvinnik, Smyslov, and Petrosian are regarded as the leader of the positional chess style. Recently, a third style of chess creative had been described, which has been dubbed as universal, is really the fusion of the positional and combative elements of style. Um, Spassky and Karadu are both regarded as displaying the style. It would seem at the moment the traditional classification of styles of play is based upon a series of studies of players' creativity. This classification has played a positive role in the development of chess culture. And even now, it has a certain positive significance that it made possible, if only in general sense, the outline the way to study the individual peculiarities of a player. But today, that is not enough. One of the basic flaws in the existing classification is that the division of styles is based on principles that are too general, strategy and tactics. It follows that creativity of players are characterized in an inflexible manner and many essential factors that differentiate their play is not revealed. Within each grouping, we can discern significant differences in the player psychological features and their imagination analysis and their technique of calculation. The attempt to analyze these components of creativity is more detailed is hindered by the traditional characterization of style by strategy and tactics. Let us compare two combative players. Um, one usually calculates concrete variations conscientiously and with precision, um, but Toulouse ideas are more often based on intuitive vision for combative threats. Starting with the existing definition that combative players are strong in concrete calculations, it could be assumed that uh, Nezmedinov and Toulouse are not really so different in their approaches to calculation, but in reality, it seems that Nezmedinov's calculations may be trusted in general. Toulouse solutions may be first checked for accuracy of calculating. The existing classification does not lead to a more clearly differentiated understanding of player style, nor does it provide the basis for more detailed characteristics of player skills. And this may lead to miscalculations in training and wrong decisions concerning the correct tactics for tournament play. It is accepted that positional player is better at giving a general appraisal of the position, but that the combative player can evaluate the concrete elements of the position with greater accuracy. Yet Petrosian, supposedly position player, is almost faultless in his execution of tactical operations. It was Spassky who correctly drew attention to the fact that the opinion that Petrosian is weak in competitive imagination is a great error. Petrosian does not appear to be an exception. Casablanca, uh, Schlechter, and other positional players have ex are excellent by relying on their strength for concrete analysis. It is clear that the concepts of combative and positional style are not entirely precise, nor sufficiently detailed. It is not even clear what we mean by the term player style. Generally, the wide philosophical sense of the word style describes the total of methods and means discovery applied by the individual with relative consistency. Let's try to consider this in a less abstract way as regards chess. Take a situation on the board where a force winning combination is possible. Any experienced player will find this combination and we should not be able to discern any difference in its execution by the various players. It is only possible to demonstrate an individual style when the position contains not only one, but several apparent equally efficient methods of play. Thus, individual style is revealed by problematic positions. At the same time, the individual player possesses a certain consistency as a way of assessing many similar positions. It is quite easy to discover a definite preference in all stages of the game in almost any master, so style is a relatively constant factor in a player's positional judgment. For this, we may assume that a player's style is consistent, individual manner of judging problematic positions. Individual style is determined by many factors, by the type of thinking, by qualities of determination and concentration, by the emotional style and by the player's character. Common characteristics can be found in the style of individual players, and so is correct to speak in the existence of groups of players with relatively similar styles. We should also consider the fact that particular styles is not a completely static phenomenon. Styles perfected it develops. For instance, basic changes have appeared in Spassky's style in recent years. As Korchny has noted, noted, having stated as a positional player, he sparkled with tactical talent after his entry into international play. But for almost the last five years, his play has become more universal in regard to the number of defeats per year. Spassky has began to approach the unbeatable Petrosian. In chess literature, there are disagreements about the characteristics of the development of styles of Kara's uh, above. Latsky and Larsen's is more often the case that a player is saddled for a long time with relentless, unchanging appraisal of his creativity. We have the example of uh, Simigan, who played a reflected significant changes, but for a decade he was called a brilliant combative player, despite the fact that he himself objected to the description on many occasions. 
The reason for the static attitude to the development of chess style is partly explained by the difficulty in analyzing style in general, but this difficulty is increased by generalizing an indistinctly defined current classification of styles. The most notable changes in style can be seen in the games of young players where contemporary chess pedagogy experiences certain difficulties in suggesting the correct individual approach, again, because of the two general criteria underlying the traditional classification of styles. However, the problem of creating new classification of styles will remain insoluble until the individual components of the question have been fully investigated. These include the classification of volitional and emotional capabilities of the players and the content of their logical thought processes. During recent years, I myself conducted some investigations into this problem. I attempted to single out the characteristic types of reasoning activities of the players based on a comparative analysis of their peculiarities and logical intuitive forms of thinking and imagination. The re reader has referred to the book Problems of Creative Psychology, where an article to this question has been published. Lasker's idea on the necessity of psychological preparation for the individual opponent and connected with this. The problems of investigating the player's styles are topical questions of the day. Moreover, the general qualities of play has risen considerable and substantial leveling of the difference of strength the players has taken. Psychological preparation has acquired a more important meaning. Player disregards the psychological factors can no longer count on successful results. It is clear the ideas advanced by Lasker concerning chess styles demand further serious investigation. Lasker also made some interesting, interesting observations about the qualities of chess thinking and about the structure of the thought processes involved in selecting a move, and he named efficiency as an essential component of players' thinking. In considering the relationship between art and logic in chess, Lasker wrote, only a perverse taste can prefer the unnecessary complicated to the simple. From two moves which lead to the same goal, a sensible person will choose the more direct, the more clear, and the less paradoxical. He also criticized the so-called brilliant games demonstrating that they're Authors distracted by extraneous effects and, in essence, ease the opponent's position. Similar incidents remind one of a battle where the dead are resurrected only for the purpose of defeating them once again. Lasker noted, however, that the choice of a move is not solely a logical conclusion based on the principle of strategy and calculation, but that it is also a peculiar application of the theory of probability, knowledge of the opponent's taste permits one to anticipate his reply with a greater degree of accuracy. In such a way, in Lasker's view, one combines the concept of chess both as a psychological battle and a game of common sense based upon conclusions drawn from theory. Capablanca, Lasker's famous rival, Capablanca did not distinguish himself by such deep psychological insight. He played the opponent less often, but cared more about his own plans. Capablanca's game revealed that totally rational character of his thought, nothing superfluous or artificial, was the slogan of the Cuban player. For this reason, Capablanca's creativity contains a rich store of instructive material which allows us to judge his methods of rational thinking over the board. In fact, he indicated the following method that guided him during the process of playing. The need to attend to the coordination of chess forces in play. Pieces and pawns should complement each other in the operations. Capablanca wrote, many players try to attack while their pieces are scattered all over the board and their actions cannot be coordinated. Ultimately, such players in search in surprise for the point of the game where they made their mistake. One must coordinate the actions of one's pieces as this is the fundamental principle of the whole game. Choosing the most efficient solution. This relates to efficient use of resources and defense as well as attack. The mobilization of the greatest possible number of pieces is feasible only attacking the king. And Capablanca was essentially careful to save time when activating his pieces. Every move which gains or saves a tempo must be considered immediately. The chosen move should not be delayed. Uh, but should be carried out on the board. You should also be confident about your decisions. If you think your move is good, then make it. Experience is the best teacher. Having once thought of an idea and decided that it's good, many players appear to make it wrongly. You must decide and without hesitation play what you think is good. Elkane was expected to uh, expand it on Lasker's opinion that it is necessary to know the opponent's psychological characteristic. Elkane's Compilation of the characteristics of his contemporaries were based upon a thorough studies of rivals' personalities. These characteristics are exact, reliable, and serve as a practical guide to action. Let's illustrate this with an expert from Alkine's remark about Capablanca. From the moment of the game where the exact sciences give way to pure art, it is then that those qualities which have given rise to Capablanca's almost legendary fame shine at the brightest, most impressive is his exceptional speed in comprehending the position. After that, his intuitive feel for position, which is practically flawless. However, these two qualities, which with the correct application should have raised their pro 
possessor to previously unattained artistic height led Capablanca surprisingly to the opposite conclusion, the blind alley, to the conviction that the art of chess was close to its end, that it was nearly exhausted. How could this happen? To answer this question correctly, is necessary to consider the psychological dangers that lie in the first Capablanca's qualities mentioned above. There are obvious advantages afforded by speedy comprehension, um, which in Capablanca's case were the ability to see almost simultaneously the whole group of tactical possibilities which are present in every complex position. But these advantages of economy and thinking and self-confidence also contain an element of danger. One may erroneously believe the good moves which are seized upon immediately because a good knowledge of the position are necessarily the best as a consequence of one creatively loses as much depth as it gains in ease. As a result of these observations and conjectures, I came to the paradoxical opinion that the moment of our match 1927, the tactician Capablanca was significantly inferior to the strategist. Consequently, one must not take Capablanca on trust in the middle game. Each of his tactical plans must be checked carefully as the possibility of an oversight on his part cannot be ruled out. These observations help Elkine to exploit Capablanca's mistakes in the match for the world championship. His psychological characterization of the Cuban grandmaster proved to be amazingly precise in the analysis of the games of the match revealed that it allowed Alkine to anticipate his opponent's plan with substantial measures of accuracy. Alkine comments on the very interesting, especially so when he warns against the danger that negative character traits can emerge when a player regards his intuitive assessment as likely to be both correct and final. Alkine's understanding of the psychological nature of chess went beyond that of Lasker. He is considered it necessary not only to consider the individual style and character of his rivals, but also to anticipate their own psychological preparation directed against them. Alkine understood not only the beneficial effects of such preparation, but also the way in which it could be used against them. For instance, in preparing for the World Championship match against Capablanca, he realized the Cuban would probably try his black to exploit the rather risky play that Alkine adhered to at the time. After the match, Alkine wrote his black, I employed the same method of simplification that Capablanca used in defense. Although this method was new for Alkine, its psychological effect completely justified its use in the contest. Alakine's approach found followers amongst his contemporaries. As an example, I recall episode concerning uh, Grandmaster Averbach, which took place when we were both being trained. Whilst inspecting Averbach's card index, I discovered in it, along with notes on the creativity and experts from the games of possible future opponents, a notebook headed, um, preparing a chess dossier on oneself is not a rarity but rather a very efficient mode of preparation logically derived from Alkine's opinion that is necessary to anticipate the direction of the opponent's preparation on theoretical, stylistic, and psychological lines that will take. Alkine emphasized the educational role of chess. He assumed that it is impossible to achieve great success at chess without training the positive qualities of one's player's character and eliminating the negative one. Alkine himself is a model in that respect. Reddy wrote of him, even at the beginning of his chess career, everyone was amazed by the richness of his imagination and the tense exertion of a determination of his violent attacks. The fact that he denied his own talent induced his admirers to fantasize about his talents, but he always subordinated his talent to reason, and this helped him attain the highest degree of mastery. Alekine frankly said, I developed my character by playing chess. Firstly, it teaches one to be objective. A player becomes a great chess master only by realizing his own faults and feelings. Unfortunately, Alekine wrote only briefly about his special features on thought processes involved in choosing a move. His conclusions are discussed in detail in chapter one. Reddy also made a number of interesting observations about the nature of players' thought processes. As a man with abstract turn in mind, Reddy emphasized the role in general evaluation in chess thinking. He warned against too much concentration or concrete calculation against the naive attempt to explain a master's art is merely the development of his ability to calculate. His remarks may be too dogmatic, but they do not contradict the concept of visual nature of thought in relationship to chess, which show these pictures to be quite distinct. Reddy wrote the uninformed think that the superior to the chess masters rest in their ability to calculate well ahead. Such players ask me how many moves ahead do I normally calculate in my combinations and are very surprised when I reply truthfully that generally it is not even one. Yet we may not rely upon calculation. How are we to choose a move? Right? He assumes that all players from the weakest to the strongest possess principles of which they may or may not be aware which guide them in the choice of move. Perhaps a weak player has only rudimentary principles. Such a player is simply satisfied if he succeeds in saying check to his opponent. It is curious that the first programs of chess play computers overlook these important observations made by Reddy. They tried to solve chess problems by sifting through variations, by trying endless concrete calculations. These attempts soon revealed their insuitability. Tori. 
introduced interesting data about the mental states the player contained in the works of Spielman and Tori. Tori deals in detail with the problems involved in developing a style, indicates that there are four stages of development of a player, manner, individuality of play, style, and role class style. Tori emphasized thought in particular, although the creativity of every master must be individual and original, yet this originality in play must be based on all that has been accumulated in the development of chess culture and the expertise of many players. But Vinnick, Soviet players have studied and developed uh, those methods of psychological preparation, which were outlined by Laster and Al Alakine. But Vinnick was an important figure in the process. He developed his own system of preparation and training, which involved elements of great interest from the psychological point of view. He drew up a personal psychological characterization of the opponent. He created maximum work capacity during play. He developed a certain psychological mood for each contest, but Vinnick conducted a well-informed, all-round psychological analysis of the opponent's play. He not only noted their merits and defects, but also the seeming unimportant details such as the long-range moods often overlooked by you, but Vinnick possessed a rare ability in that he did not limit himself to compiling an exact characterization. Rather, he also converted his conclusions to concrete opening schemes and a general matter of conducting battle, which was subjectively the most unpleasant for his opponents. The depth of his understanding of his opponent as a human being was felt by both Smyslov and Tell in their return matches against Bach Vinnick. By reason of his own character traits, Bach Vinnick was not inclined to trust his initial impressions, but preferred to amass a sufficient amount of psychological observation before drawing conclusion. Possibly because of this, he conducted his return matches with considerably more confidence than his first ones. Long ago, Bach Vinnick realized that it is psychologically difficult for a man to adjust to once a new activity, for instance, a tournament game. But Vinnick therefore always took a walk before or the round in order to attune himself to the coming struggle, to mobilize his force of determination, to cut himself off completely from everything that was not concerned with the game. In the earlier times, he regularly arrived at the tournament all 10 to 15 minutes before the round. These activities helped him detach himself from the extraneous distractions and allowed him to concentrate solely upon the game from the moment the clock was started. But Vinnick correctly pointed out that it is only in a relaxed frame of mind that one can labor successfully over the board. Through special training methods, he learned how to struggle against inceptive adverse emotions, yet Bob Vinnick's equanimity at the board does not indicate that he was different. He always had a certain amount of fighting spirit in the best sense of the term. He is considered that he was obliged to fight until the end to put all those ability in the nervous energy of the game. At times, he lost games in the region of the 11th to 13th round because of growing tiredness, but in general, the principles of playing with complete concentration was justified by his results. Bob Vinnick made a close study of the problems involved in tournament regime, uh, the need for a methodological approach to the analysis of adjourned games and the conditions which lead to time trouble being amongst them. The methods of approving meant that Bob Vinnick developed became the basis of the training of the Soviet players for many years. However, Aberbach pointed out Bob Vinnick's training program did not always have desirable results since it was copied without questions by trainers and masters alike. Despite Bob Vinnick's warning, it is possible that this system of preparation is unsuitable for some players. Every master should follow it with care and apply it with reference to his own individual peculiarities and habits. An example of this seen an important question that arises during training. How long before a contest should the training period end and how many draw days should be given over to resting? Using his own experience, Bob Vinnick has said that training should cease five days before the tournament, but it became apparent that in practice that this does not suit everybody. Their players who step into the rhythm of a tournament play at once. For them, the five days of rest is useful. Uh, but there are others who usually start tournament slowly and lose valuable points whilst warming up. Instead of rest, they would be well served by playing serious tra training games. Much also depends upon the awareness of the trainer. Okay, so very interesting uh, opening. So let's look a little at uh, oh, Jennifer. Thanks for showing up. Just uh, finishing. I figure I'm just going to jump straight into. Not sure if you made a decision about. Uh, Modern day debates, what you do, but I forgot to start putting forward some of this, uh, my research. So let's look at this image, this concept that's going to be related to chunking. And a lot of this, this is written before, you know, the Chase and Simon and chunking theory. So you get a little more older school, Freudian, pre uh, modern period psychological look. What is the chess image? The study of the purity of players thinking of perhaps the most important problem in chess psychology. Part of this problem involves determining the typical defects in a player's thinking activity and attempting to find a way to increase the efficiency of his thought processes. To consider a degree of chess players think in terms of images, what we want to understand by the phrase chess image and what are the characteristic features. 
There is no unanimity in the definition of a chess image. The psychologist Malkin wrote, in the course of the game, one accumulates a large number of chess images, or in other words, typical positions about which one has formed an assessment. These positions are a central part of the language with the help of which the master composes his poems. In the course of a game, that calculation of variation is a necessary primary for the transfer from one typical position to the other. It is quite obvious from the statement that offers opinion, the main characteristic of an image is the element of generality. The chess image is not only a visual picture of the position on the board, but is also the assessment of a typical position in the sense that the image is a generalization, which takes into account the peculiar relationship between the pieces and their possible moves. The concrete positions themselves, which occur in the course of establishing relationships between particular elements of the situation, are not regarded as images. Here, the visual side of the image is disregarded. Some other investigations are similar opinion. Reddy quotes Tarish and Rosenthal's opinion to prove that visual elements and thinking are of a subordinate character. Tarish writes, real chess lovers whose thoughts are completely absorbed in the combination and plans which arise in the course of the game differ from a beginner and that he does not see wooden pieces with a horse's head, but rather pieces having a property of moving in a certain way, a piece which is equivalent to approximately three pawns and which stands ready to start an attack and so on. The chess lover does not see wooden toy. He does not see what the pieces is made of. All he sees the significance that that piece as a knight, the deeper one penetrates into a combination and the less one's eyes notice the material of chess board and the pieces. All the chess player's attention is concentrated inside himself and even he cast his eyes on outside objects and does not really register them. So I'm actually going to uh, propose my own theory in that there's some somewhat of a narrative of chess players beside that, that uh, not just like an image, but there's a narrative understanding of this, you know, the understanding of the position uh, that uh, that uh, comes from different theories like uh, Robert Schiller's narrative economics and things. And, and so it's an interesting idea Duvet is mentioning here that's not, not here. So uh, we have to try to go through this quickly. I recommend people reading all of this. quite interesting. The degree of generalization chess images varies and can be looked at in two aspects, the development of the player and in relation to the objective complexity of the position in general. Generally, the player's thought process is built upon the course of his attainment of mastery and his acquisition of knowledge. Acquaintance with the principle of the strategy of tactics of chess stimulates the development of logical component of thinking. Binet was justified in holding the growth of chess player's strength accompanied definite stages in development of its faculty of abstracting from concrete material. The element of generality of chess images also depends on the complexity of the position on the board. The player evaluates a multitude of positions using his knowledge and practical experience, even though some of these positions may be quite difficult to any different from any he has previously encountered. In such case, he knows approximately what to do and how to proceed as these positions give rise to more generalized images. However, a considerable number of positions cannot be adequately assessed purely by comparisons with earlier ones. Some elements in this assessment can be taken from previous experience, the characteristic position of individual piece, or the familiar threat of a fork. So I'm disagreeing here, there, the idea of the narrative, because the narrative takes into the value of the piece and how you view the piece. So it's like a narrative, whether it's a war or family or a team. So it's not just purely the geometry of uh, the possible calculations, but the narrative related to how people see the pieces. So stay tuned for, you know, maybe Duvid one day will publish a paper and I'm already hinting to you things that uh, are not included in what I'm presenting to you now. So here's another, the retained image. This is a transference of an assessment of a past position or an action of the separate pieces in unaltered form to a new situation that has arisen on the board. In this way, the past continues its activity into the present to the extent of etching out reality. When a retained image occurs and the player's thought has become static, his ability to switch his attention has become reduced. These are all interesting. Uh, maybe in a more chess-focused stream, um, we could look at this into more depth. The retained of the actual chess positions and examples, but I'm not going to go through any chess examples. I'm trying to finish up here. The retained image is sometimes caused not only by a single piece in its functions or by an individual square on the board, but by a group of pieces or squares with more complex relationships. Having been the objects of deep cognition during the course of the game, it is not only individual pieces, squares, and moves that remain in the mind in the individual uncontained form, but also the tactical and strategic ideas as well.
with the inert image. Inert images are characterized by the fact that the assessment of the existing position is held to be the final assessment of the entire game. Although the game continues, mentally it is already finished. The player imagines that the only minor difficulty remains before he attains his goal and that these do not require great mental exertion. Thus, the present often incorrectly evaluated is mechanically transferred to the future. Therefore, the player's analytical objectivity and his precision assessing the position currently on the board are weakened. In practice, the inert images appear in connection with incorrect and hasty inference to so that the material positional preponderance achieved or the recognition of well-known type of position that has occurred predetermine the result of the game. When an inert image appears, the player relaxes his attention. The excitement of struggling for the desired result is now placed by self-confidence and even apathy as it seems that the goal has been Reach the resulting complacent attitude to the position drives away the feeling of responsibility, the ability to switch attention, and the capacity to analyze ahead are sharply lowered. And this reduction in mental activity is generally accompanied by errors. It is then quite common that completely won positions are not won, absolutely drawn positions are lost. It should be noted that inert images characterized by the tendency towards a completed appraisal of position are marked by a high degree of generalization. So the forward image, forward image arises when considering possible future changes in the situation. The role of future events in the game is overestimated to such an extent that they appear to the player almost as if they exist in the present. Bloomfield wrote, as far as I can tell from my own experience, there are moments when the image created by visual concepts crowds out reality. The negative role of forward image manifests itself in two ways. And at first, the opponent's possible threats, often uh, non-existent anyways, are accepted as already present. They are exaggerated and transformed to the mind as gigantic threats. The future possibilities become an obsession and are treated as real factors in the assessment of the current position. In other cases, too much significance attached to the possible future active maneuver by one's own pieces. The fact that the realization is as yet inadequately prepared is not sufficiently appreciated. On the contrary, mirages generally created in the imagination are mechanically used to assess positions on the board. The failure to transfer one's attention adequately from the supposed to the real reach the cases where players are carried away by madcap schemes. And many examples uh, now in the study of why people make errors. And you know, specifically in chess, that will be general for why people make errors in thought in general for debate and all other activities or just general self-improvement of people who prefer, prefer to make less errors. Hence the benefit of chess as a method to help people make less errors. So let's see a little bit on intuition. Intuition is the direct way of reaching the truth. The quick solution suddenly comes to mind. Probably a few concepts are to be found that give rise to such lively arguments as does that of intuition, and serious attempts have been made to eradicate its use altogether. The debate has also involved the world of chess. So does intuitive have intuition have a place in chess creativity? On the subject of chess creativity, Bronstein in his books, the 1953 Candidates Tournament, wrote, however, there is a fourth ingredient, and perhaps it is the most attractive, often it is often forgotten, although it's often forgotten, I have it in mind, intuition, or if you will, chess imagination. Intuition was and is one of the foundations of chess creativity. Thus, Branson emphasized the role of intuition, but simultaneously equates it with the player's imagination. In his book, The Attack, Panop writes, of course, intuition is not the correct word. As we well know, intuition is the beloved concept of the foreign idealistic philosopher, implying that beneath intuition, there's a direct comprehension of truth, something like a revelation from above. Players must be guided by the instinct for chess, which furnishes them with the necessary conviction or the correctness of, say, a sacrifice in position where it is impossible to analyze all variations. So Panov downgrades intuition, but emphasizes chess instinct. From what follows, a clear, it will become clear that it is rather a misunderstanding of terminology, but not a denial that a player can make a combative decision without making an exact calculation or preliminary series of linked conclusions. Linder's opinion, every game beginning to end constitutes a chain of mental conclusions, each logically linked to the next. He emphasizes the idea that any game is always a total conscious process where anything irrational or unconscious has no place. What exactly do we mean by intuition? Let's first acquaint ourselves with what the Marxist theory of knowledge tells us about intuition, since a correct philosophical understanding of intuition will help us more determine its place in chess creativity. Pavlov said one of his uh, celebrated lectures, I find that all intuition should be understood that man remembers the conclusion, but not the entire road 
over which he approached and prepared the conclusion. This is because he did not analyze his way to the conclusion. The Philosophical Dictionary states, intuition plays an auxiliary role in the process of learning, behind the capacity to suddenly discover the truth. There stands in reality accumulated experience and knowledge that has already been acquired. The results of intuitive knowledge have no need of any criteria of truthfulness, but they are logically proved and have been tested in practice. It follows from these statements that intuition in general and its connection with chess in particular is definitely a component of thinking as opposed to logical analysis and intuitive decision reveals only the result of mental operations which themselves remain unperceived at the moment in chess creativity intuition appears as a sudden discovery at which moment the prepared preparation for this decision is not conscious in intuitive decision there is an awareness of some kind of result the image of a series of moves and maneuvers but the details the intervening links in the thought process are subconsciously omitted such as decision is conceived by the player as nothing whole and integrated i grasp at the position on the board as the musician grasps the chords entirely rope and a especially which to point out that the objects of intuition may be the combative as well as the positional elements of the game for example refer the beautiful combination um so encourage people who like chess to look at some of these examples probably too much to read these explanations that have the chess examples and you could think of uh, these in terms of qualia for when i bring this back to the multiple truth hypothesis and the hard problem of consciousness that these various aspects that we're talking about in chess are actually forms of qualia in terms of consciousness um so like attention among the psychological problems of contemporary chess, the problem of attention is central. The significance of high level of attentiveness needed for the study of chess theory and for the successful participation in tournaments is appreciated by trainers and practicing chess players from beginning to grandmaster. Uh, Grekov writes, chess demands a prolonged and constant concentration of attention. It's quite clear that one can well achieve a winning position, but then as a result of relaxing the tension or failing to pay attention, even for a second, turn the one game into a lost one. How many such cases there are not only in offhand games, but also in serious matches, and not only in, among ordinary amateurs, but even the most distinguished masters. An essential precondition to perfecting one's chess is fight this failing. The problem of understanding the psychological tension in chess is now very topical and important. Serious research in the field will doubtless uncover much that is both new and useful for the general psychological preparation of the chess player and for chess education as a whole. The belief that chess player has a highly developed powers of concentration is widespread. When a chess player makes a careless slip on his day-to-day -day activities, the response is often one quite sincere and amazed, but how could a man who can so successfully calculate long variations have overlooked such a simple matter? Besides players itself, as a rule, convinced of their own capabilities in the matter of attention, the convention is manifest the conviction is manifested in the attitudes of many of our colleagues who regard gross blunders and obvious oversights as being incidental and uncharacteristic of the chess playing fraternity often after the loss of a game the loser tries to prove that he played superbly not just by demonstrating the possibilities opened him during the course of a game but also by the whole manner why if he had not been for that piece of bad luck then are the mistakes really so accidental that they cannot be explained by the mistakes inadequate experience or the uh Meager theoretical, meager theoretical knowledge, of course. We do not intend to deny that playing chess has a positive role in developing attention, the sequence of changing events on the board, the necessary of balancing various differing possibilities. Even the most trivial undoubtedly help the development of attention, which is a crucial requirement for success in chess. Is therefore not surprising. Um, Greca, Rudik, and other authorities assert that chess is an effective means of combating serious failings of attention, such as absent-mindedness. Greca, for the man who is prone to absent-mindedness and lapse of attention, the capacity for protracted and unabating concentration developed at the chessboard is a precarious acquisition, is a precious acquisition. On the basis of many years' of observation, I make it bold to claim that several cases of sharp fall in absent-mindedness in children and adolescents have coincided with beginning of serious attacks and traction to chess, and I have no doubt. This happened in consequence of the influence of chess on psyche. This opinion is also strengthened by the experience of teaching courses at the uh, schools in Leningrad and other places. Despite the comparatively high level of attention in chess players, blunders and errors occur again and again in tournaments and presumably seem to be incompatible with the level of play of the participants. Here we can explain nothing by reference to ignorance or intention, and it's simply ridiculous to speak of lack of knowledge in a master when he fails to see, for instance, a one move threat to the queen, attempts of playing such explain such extraordinary lapses by time pressure or fatigue are not always convincing 
No doubt these factors do play an important part in the deterioration of attention, but all the same, although they provide fertile ground for errors, they tell us little about the nature of these errors. It would be wrong, after all, to regard the causes of a crime as being a dark night, bad weather, a lonely spot, or other conditions which only favor the creation of an unpleasant situation for the victim. The explanation behind the many blunders and oversights which first seem to be inexplicable apparently depend upon a study of the individual peculiarities of players' attention, and we shall see these personal and at times quite typical defects of attention appear most often and with greater force in especially unfavorable conditions, such as time, trouble, or fatigue. But before we begin to discuss the various aspects of attention in chess, first we must consider how the word attention is understood in the science of psychology. What is attention? Attention is a concentration of cerebral activity on a certain object. This is how the term is defined in psychology, since attention is always focused in a particular direction, automatically includes other subjects, phenomena, or thoughts about them. How often uh, we witness a chess player completely absorbed in his game, taking no notice of the world around him. At such moments, it is only the chessboard, which is an intriguing pattern of pieces and the pawns that exist for him. Attention is not, however, uniformly distributed over the sections of the board and all, over all the pieces. The highest concentration of thought is focused, as a rule, on the main decisive area of the chess battle, where carrying out an operation on the king side, chess player is somewhat, sometimes completely distracted from the positions on the other side of the board, and for some time, the queen side is forgotten. And this is not some mysterious peculiarity to the human mind, it's simply due to the selective nature of attention, which produces from a large number of objects, only those few which are the most important and exciting at the moment in question. An important practical conclusion follows, one should not aim at uniformly high concentration of attention over the whole of the board and over all the pieces at the same time. One has to learn to regulate one's attention, to direct it towards the most important point, and then in one's own time, to switch to other objects. An overall view of the board and the assessment of the position are built up gradually by switching one's concentration from one section of the battle to another. It is important to note that while attentiveness is key psychological condition of an individual, it is also instrumental in the acquisition of knowledge. When we see our opponents move and start trying to remember the variation we had just worked out, devise a combination or assess a situation where you're dealing with facts either new or known in short, with a flow of chess information, assess of chess knowledge. This information comes in the guise of perception, an image in the memory, or as an imagination or thought. One might think that attention was irrelevant here since on its own it does not provide any information. Nevertheless, it is a necessary prerequisite for all the above mentioned cognitive processes. Attention organizes and regulates the course of the processes. It is the, their valuable ally. After all, it is only by concentrating deeply that it's possible to think over one's opponent's plan with reasonable consistency, recall similar positions from previous games, and weigh up the pros and cons when planning one's own move. Tension is also closely linked with emotions and the will. It is through his emotions that a human being reacts to the surrounding reality, emotional experience of a strong influence on the ebb and flow of a chess player's attention, especially during competitions. For example, such negative emotional states as confusion, anger, fear, lack of confidence, and complacency can induce a considerable falling off of a chess player's vital activities, including his attention. Uh, I'm not going to read these, but uh, it could be unfamiliar conditions uh, during competition. Um, one's position determined the significance of the result of the game. Um, unpleasant opponent, opponent's behavior. Controlling one's emotions, um, you know, the, the these things are listed in other books. So I just read the deliberate change of direction and the content of one's imagination and thoughts, an arbitrary change in the direction and the concentration of one's attention. The rule one benefits from placing a reasonable limitation on special chess preparation before a game. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Um, his next chapter is on deficiencies in attention, so what attention means to chess. Um, in terms, like I said, the, a lot of these chess training books, like how to become a chess player, a better chess player or chess master, are really how to become a better meditator, how to become a better thinker. And that, uh, you know, say the, the correlations, we talk like our chess players more intelligent, does becoming better at chess make you more smarter? We're going to look at a lot more studies like that, like Duvid, who uses chess to, uh, you know, largely teach kids to... Um, become better people, not just thinkers, but understanding a more sensitive and whole series of things. 
And uh, you know, one of the certain things like the value of attention um, is, is uh, certainly related. And so, you know, definitely wanted to read and look at some of this uh, psychology and chess. So let's look here. It's the deficiencies of attention. Attention is a complicated psychological process which manifests itself in different ways. It is interesting to examine the significance of particular properties of attention in chess to describe some typical deficiency of attention and to discuss ways of uh, reading these deficiencies so the player is better equipped for over-the-board combat. I've investigated the characteristics of attention through the analysis of games, observations during the course of tournaments, and also by means of a series of experiments, and I've succeeded in establishing some typical shortcomings in players' development of attention. In particular, I examine in detail instances of lapses of attention since their prevention has a prime practical significance. So the transfer of attention. We turn first to the dynamic features of attention. Is there anything we could say about the mobility of attention when it is clear that a profound degree of concentration is essential to all serious mental work? Such doubts are pointless in chess as in other kinds of creative ac activity. Attention is not focused at, on on changing object, but is linked to a constantly changing situation on the board. Each concentration of thought, each attempt to assess a position or work out a variation inevitably requires us to envisage the possible rearrangement of the pieces and the appearance of new positions in the game. This is why the fact that one's attention is deep and constant does not mean that it is absolutely static. It is lively and mobile process. The statement is in accordance with uh, Pavlov's idea of the psychological nature of attention. Pavlov wrote, the sector engaged in the optimal activity is not fixed quite the reverse. It constantly moves over the whole of the larger hemisphere and the matter which depends on the connection existing between the centers under the influence of the external stimuli. Correspondingly, of course, the area of low excitation, excitation also changes. The unity of the stability of the mobility of the attention by human beings is peculiarly evident from his ability to switch attention. By the switching of attention, we mean fully conscious, deliberate transfer of the attention from one object to another. For example, passing from uh, working out one variation to another, transferring one piece in one mind to another square, working out captures, estimating the possibilities of positions and so on. Switching the attention is very important for the chess player and there are constant changes in the position on the board. Sufficient mobile attention helps the chess player to not only transfer his attention from one position to another when appropriate, but also devote um, to each position just as much attention as necessary for choosing the next move. So he gives a lot of uh, examples. So he mentions uh, Kotov and the Think Like a Grandmaster that I showed earlier. Kotov's method contains a very important condition. The calculation is limited in time, and the pieces are not allowed to be moved during the course of the analysis. This achieves an optimal symbolization of the tournament situation, and the calculation is harder and more disciplined. By repeating these exercises several times, one can achieve surprising results. It is necessary to note every mistake, uh, even the most insignificant ones in one's analysis. This method has been used in my work as a trainer, the technique of the calculation, the tactical version, a vision of a number of my trainees have improved considerably as a result of such experiments. Another dive, the same purpose of the reading of chess literature from the page or sort of blindfold analysis. Instability of attention. Distribution of attention, the expression breadth of attention encompasses the properties of volume and distribution. The volume of attention is measured by the number of objects which are taken in simultaneously. For example, one can register a certain number of letters in a single glance. Chunking, a distribution is a more complex property than volume. It is through the distribution of attention that a human being is able to cope simultaneously with two or more activities. The distribution of attention also manifests itself in the ability to perceive different facets of a single object. Proper distribution of attention in chess presents a difficulty of considerable significance this is because of the exceptional variety of the possible variations as well as the need for a constant watch on one's opponent's thinking processes. The distribution of attention is closely connected with the transfer of attention since the dynamics of the chess situation are exceptionally high. In their book, The Psychology of Playing Chess, uh, Dyakov, Petrovsky, and Rudik write, at every move, the general construction changes, the sections of the paths along which the pieces move make up the content of the thought and the elements of the world in which the chess player lives. This description is a schematization of the action of the game which animates our view of chess positions by regarding them as collections of points, each with the initial point of certain trajectory in motion. The chess player's brain is thus presented with a completely special world of dynamic relations.
a bunch of uh, actual chess examples of deficiencies. So dispersion of attention. By this, we mean excessive breadth of attention, the striving to confine the infinite on the chessboard, the distribution of the capacities of attention over a very large number of elements in a complicated position leads to a weakened attention on the main decisive area of the board, which in turn makes the correct assessment of the position very difficult. Often we encounter uh, thought dispersal aimed at analyzing numerous concrete variations while considerations of general strategic planning are pushed into the background. Such cases of being carried away by concrete factors to the detriment of general considerations leads to a situation in which the salient factors of the position fall from the field of attention. This is likely to lead to time trouble in the general assessment of the position itself, uh, not be completely objective if that it suffers from excessive detail. No should be taken of the substantial difference between the characteristics of instability of attention is unnecessary transference when we examine above in the dispersion of attention with the instability of attention the mind wavers between one idea the principal one uh, um, at any given moment and another but in the case of dispersed attention we observe the effort to embrace all the variety and detail of current positions a single act of perception it's the power of concentration by the power of concentration, we understand the intensity of attention to an activity and the degree of absorption in it. People's powers of concentration differ greatly. The following degrees of intensity can be distinguished in chess. Total absorption in the game or more restrained concentration, alternating with distractions such as looking at neighboring games, spectators, and so on. Superficial concentration is, for instance, when one looks through games quickly without a proper understanding. And lastly, weak concentration with an unstable direction of attention, such as unstable wandering concentration, often uh, borders on absent-mindedness. Power of player's attention depends on several factors, his temperament, the complexity of the position, the significance of the outcome of the game, tiredness, and so on. Apparently, at one tournament, it happened that the water jug fell on the floor with a resounding crash. Almost all those present looked up, with the exception of the English master, Vern, who carried on the gazing at the board as if nothing had happened. Later, said they had not heard anything, and this is not exceptional. Although we have just distinguished four degrees of power attention, we have to note that the character of the chess struggle depends on the development to a high level in the faculty of attention so that in normal tournament conditions, an experienced chess player has a very high power of attention. The ability to maintain a prolonged and constant intensity of attention also are very important accomplishments in chess. The game lasts a long time, and the slackening of attention for even a short period can lead to irreparable consequences. How often an advantage game after many hours of arduous toil is thrown away by a single careless move? Important necessary condition for maintaining the strength of a concentration is a sufficient variety in one's thoughts and impression. Anything uh, monotonous quickly weakens the attention. Uh, Stanislavski said that in order to keep one's attentiveness, it is not enough just to stare at the object. One has to observe it from different points and sort of vary one's perception of it before making a move. The chess player usually asks himself, what will I gain by moving this piece? The answer can be winning a pawn or so on. Um, Diversity is also a necessary condition for increasing attention during chess study. While studying openings, some people swap up variations, which usually come to an end between the 12th and 15th move. I've seen quite experienced first category players preparing for game using this monotonous method. In all probability, the power of concentration falls quickly during such preparations since the knowledge obtained in such a way has proved to be short-lived. Romanovsky wrote that it was useful to combine the study of openings with analysis of combinations typical of the variation and with the analysis of games beginning with the openings and questions. Romanovsky's advice stresses the thesis that deeper knowledge can be acquired through varied approaches along with the diversity of one's thought and impressions, involvement in activity, assist in the development of power attention. Bloomfield states that he remembered the games he played himself considerably longer than games by somebody else, which he had annotated in spite of the fact that he had to spend two or three days analyzing them, consequently spent much longer over them. However, there's nothing mysterious about that the process of playing a game is more active than that of annotating another player's game and demands a more intensive attention. Involvement in activity ensures better retention. First steps of a chess trainer has to teach his pupil independence and ambition to do something with his own bare hands. Preconditioning high level of concentration is clear understanding of what one is doing. Consequently, a correct and objective assessment of the events on the board increases the attention when one has a definite aim and knows what to do. One can think with more concentration and purposefulness.
Every okay. To what extent? The extent which attention is dependent on fashions and chess. Every player possesses his own individual characteristics. Is it possible to single out groups with similar characteristics or creativity in these groups? We call it styles. And yet, many players of various styles found them to spell the creative uh, uh, current trends in chess. Thus, in their time, the teachings of Steinmetz, Tarish, Capablanca, and other great masters have exerted influence upon the opening repertoire of the methods and technique applied to many of their contemporary varying styles. Today, a similar picture can be observed when the King's Indian and the Sicilian dominate the openings, but in the middle games, the most popular positions are those with dynamic tensions in the center and a pawn storm against the enemy king fortress, which contains the Fianchetto bishop. Therefore, in our observation of the present phase of chess development, various permissions, positions remain outside the notes of many players of various types and character. For instance, those positions with symmetrical pawn formations in the center, such as the right for Orthodox and Slav systems or the Queen's Gambit, somehow such positions are regarded as dull, even as drosh. They're not given thought and attention. It's transferred to more modern arrangements of the pieces. Is this not in tribute to fashion? Time of the story about the seminary held in 1967 for young masters is quite instructive. The Grand Master noticed that six young players, although of different creative tendencies, all ignored positions such as those mentioned above. But in the more modern games, they sought with interest and found the tactical and strategic ideas that have often been encountered in recent years. The dependence of attention on aesthetic views. A pretty sacrifice or an unusual idea generally attract the attention of players of various styles and the attraction, uh, definite difficulty observed in transferring the attention from some impressive looking variation to a more prosaic one. But one which possibly more efficient, so great the aesthetic factors in conditioning the player's attention at times. A serious effort of will is required to deviate from the impressive but less potent maneuver in favor of the dry prose, which leads to a goal more quickly. Many masters are seemingly convinced that the more efficient a move is, the more beautiful it is. Yet in the mind of nearly everyone lies the feeling that to sacrifice the queen and win five moves is preferable to an easily gained victory in four moves. Very possible that these views are explained by the powerful propaganda over the years of favor of sacrificing the risk on the chessboard, doubtless these views are controversial, but what is to be done? Romanticism and chess literature is still successfully contrasted with realism. The dependence of attention upon the individual features of the opponent's play. Chess activity presumes not only a contemplation of position from one's own side, but also the simultaneous prediction of the path of the opponent's thinking. The question, what is my opponent thinking? What is his aim? Generally, accompanies sees the choice of every move. Thus, the player's attention is correctly disciplined by knowledge of the strong and weak points of his opponent's play, especially penetrating the typical features of his creative style. Dependence of attention and style. Examine the special features of player's attention in a fairly detailed manner. An important practical question is, how are these features interrelated in the different styles of play? Apparently, it's possible to answer this with a single sentence. In a master's uh, creativity, we observe certain weakness and certain strengths of attention. Similarly, there are apparently definite tendencies that link the various styles of play with definite qualitative facets of attention. How chess improves attentiveness. We've analyzed some of the Properties of the process of attention as manifested in chess. In conclusion, I would like to say a few words about the use of chess and the development of man's attention generally. A serious study of chess requires a high level of attentiveness. The slightest slackening of attention is heavily penalized so that it's essential to be able to maintain a sufficient level of intensity of attention for a long time. This capacity is very beneficial in study and scientific work and other activities which require considerable mental effort. The training of attention brought about by playing chess helps to fight tendencies to distraction and disciplines one's character and thinking processes. Psychological studies show that performing independent work requiring in initiative and creativity is important for the development of attention, especially in early childhood and use. In this respect, chess is a rich field for activity in the course of a game a chess player has to invent and carry out plans and search for every ever more original notions in order to stand his opponent's plots. Laziness of thought, the lack of inventiveness and passivity are punished in chess quickly and remorsefully. In chess, every piece has to be thought of dynamically in relation to its value and significance of possible movements on the board. The opinion that a chess player is in a role of constant uh, changing relations and thus evidently uh, correct, the fact demands from him a development of the dynamic properties of attention and its distribution. And this in turn is very important for overcoming faults of character. Chess helps fight distraction and teaches us to work in unfavorable conditions. Often the presence of other people irritates and prevents concentration. 
the conditions of chess tournaments where, as a rule, there are many people, audience participates, and controllers help to train the ability to concentrate in the most difficult conditions. It is no secret that the reason for poor productivity in some of the very able people is an adequate attention which cannot withstand uh, distraction. Controlled one's attention is attained through struggling with changing moods and adverse emotions. Chess shows us how important it is to lose control of oneself after reverse when difficulties or the face of unexpected helps to preserve the ability to work and to be attentive amidst difficulties. It is said that chess is for those whose will is strong. It is also true that chess generates willpower. The dynamics of chess players' attention cannot be isolated from the idiosyncrasies of its character, thinking and other psychological qualities. Consequently, the causes of many chess phenomena, in particular the weaknesses discussed above, must not be sought only in the area between two rook files, but rather in the general development of the personality. The saying that personality comes through in chess is quite true. The character of a player determines his style. The weak and the strong sides of a character are inevitably visible in his mistakes and successes. For this reason, however, much it may seem to us that blunders and other uh, peccadillos on the 64 squares are specifically chess failings. In fact, they are due to disorganization and decision on critical behavior and many other human deficiencies. When psychologists speak of insufficient development of an independent will, they mean a tendency to easily influence by others. Uh, this can make itself felt in chess. Uh, Eberlzell appears to have lost his game against uh, Rogozin in the 10th USSR Championship purely through succumbing to an alien influence. The strong influence of his opponent being uncritically accepted paralyzes power and made him accept his adversary's evaluation of the position with a resultant loss in the flexibility of his attention. At a crucial moment of the game, Rogozin put a rook on prize, counting on winning it back with a bishop, which, however, was pinned. Eyewitnesses relate. He was plunged in deep thought, probably saw his opponent's intention at once to check with the bishop, and so win back the rook since the exchange of rooks was disadvantageous for him. And moreover, he trusted his opponent. He did not even check the variation beginning with taking the rook. Meanwhile, the atmosphere in the hall had become exceedingly tense. One of the fans could not bear it anymore and shouted, um, take the rook. I can't see. Don't interrupt. Um, a few more minutes passed, and all of a sudden, White did not take the black rook, but retreated. It is difficult to describe the reaction in the hall. At first, everyone looked around uh, without understanding what it was all about, and then he realized everything and clutched his head in despair. What sort of magic is that, one might think? How is it that a master with plenty of time to spare missed a one-move win? But his nomadic is just chess and a manifestation of the character of a chess player. The reason that the hypnosis worked was probably that uh, he didn't realize uh, that a young chess player player believed blindly in the authority of his famous opponent and didn't even dare to think that he might have blundered. Belief in the correctness of opponent play move was so strong that he could not rid himself of the impression, detach himself, and check the peculiarities of his position once more. And so that's all I'm going to read from this great stuff. At the end of this chapter, he's got, uh, um, at the end of the book, he has something called uh, um, uh, Know Thyself which, uh, you know, very important, you say, it's like chess is like a form of meditation and uh, a way to increase your mental activity and to know yourself better. So I recommend chess. That's why I coach chess. I would encourage it. So uh, very glad, uh, you know, rambled for almost four hours and uh, hopefully advance some of these uh, teachings. And I don't have too many comments, so my conclusion right now, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to put forward some of this research on chess. I have to organize it, and you know, hopefully in the next stream, I do. Um, you know, since I put some of this information forward, and we have kind of the history of chess studies going back a hundred years, and uh, you know, get a bigger picture of uh, where you know how does chess play into um, the study of thought, consciousness decision-making, memory, free will. And I plan on expanding on these things much more. And so today I just wanted to put out there some of the best in chess research, specifically, you know, thought in chess and De Groot, one of the most quoted psychological studies ever, not just uh, from chess, it's study on chess. Um, you know, so this book, uh, Blindfold Chess, I haven't really had too much, you know, some chess players watch this or chess players want to discuss that'd be interesting. Um, you know, I mean, Jennifer, probably the only person who really is greatly following my ideas related to the consciousness and uh, the multiple truth hypothesis. 
Um, but you know, hopefully from these videos I'll formulate it better if people were just interested in a single topic that this video, um, I believe this will help you improve your chess. So if you're just a chess player who wants to improve at chess, this should benefit you. But uh, you know, I'm not doing this as an improve your chess stream. And uh, I have a lot more stuff uh, that I plan on doing. So uh, here on chess, I would imagine three more streams on chess, a good few more in the multiple truth hypothesis, mostly relating to physics. And then I have other ones on Judaism, more spiritual topics. So maybe even tomorrow or this week, I'll end up doing another stream on chess. So appreciate people tuning in. Hope people gain from this and you do a service. You know, for myself, I'm going to watch this over like always. And uh, I'll, I'll put in the description and the link in the chat with timestamps. I'm also putting my stuff on um, BitChute. So have a great night, everybody, and uh, blessings.